Okay, here we here we are again. Of course, you, at this time you know my name, Eric Deloach. I'm a book author and I'm host of American Authors and Others. And we have our special guest who's been very generous with us uh, to talk to the audience and 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 get to know you guys and really you know inspire you guys on so many le levels. I mean, I mentioned off camera with him, I had a friend that I went to high school with uh, that contacted me, really enjoyed the last interview so much that now the guy wants to write a book. Isn't that beautiful? I think that is so beautiful. And we, we definitely owe, owe it to our guests. And we probably will see a book from our guests coming in the future. But let's talk about this particular cast, the third interview here. It, Possibly in the future there'll be some more interviews, but 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 this is the third one and, and it's it's a beautiful one. This one is about him as the artist, as the as the world figure, as you know, basically you can say almost like almost the um, uh, an ambassador of jazz. Okay, and we'll talk about his organization. We're just going to talk about him. And this particular uh, interview is for the kids. It's, it's for it's for the adults as well, absolutely. But it is we, we're dedicating this for the youth. Um, there's nothing wrong with rap rap music. It's there's good rap music. It's there's good all types of music and there's bad all types of music. But jazz is a universal language as he has has educated us, and it's a premier, you know, language in music and. So we want to inspire the youth of all groups in the United States and around the world to really bare minimum to be, bare minimum to become listeners of jazz. But if there's some talent there, you might learn something, young people, and parents pay attention as well. So with no further ado, we're going to allow, our, as we always do, our special guest, this celebrity, to introduce himself. Hopefully we might be blessed with some with some free jazz. We crave that. We, we, we're hooked in, locked in. And there may be something else that he may do on with music that, oh, you guys didn't even know. But we'll wait and see what he blesses us with. But at this time, let's let our esteemed guest introduce himself and at least we'll get some more free jazz. We know we crave, we love that stuff. So at this time, we'll allow our um, esteemed guest to introduce himself and we'll go from there. Thank you, you, Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, my name is Rick Delrada and uh, I'm a musician. Um, I've been a musician pretty much all my life. Um, singer, pianist, multi-keyboardist, composer, producer, uh, just a, a lot of different things. Um, related to just an, an all around passion for music, music of all styles, all genres, all over the world. And uh, of course, being an American, I couldn't help but really gravitate towards the art form of jazz uh, because it's just, um, it's just such an incredible ocean to swim in. So um, I've had a wonderful time and I'm gonna kind of give you an example of the beauty of how diverse it is right now, actually. Uh, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to uh, play uh, a continual little series that we've been doing with this podcast, since this is the third one. So this is the third version of a piece called Free J.A. And that kind of came about by um, a, a great jazz musician who... I had played free jazz with where you kind of just improvise just freely. And um, he kind of told me that if I could do my part to keep that idiom going, that it's an amazing idiom, free jazz. So we had that. And then we had this a little story back line of how the word jazz itself is actually misspelled. And the real spelling comes from the Creole word J-A-S-S, -S, jazz. And uh, I, I said on the first podcast how I had uh, gone to Haiti and was so amazed that they had a giant poster above the, the stage that said, welcome jazz for peace, J-A-S-S, -S, which was the real spelling. So for the piece, I took 
free jazz. And I took over the, I took out those two words, ZZ, that were misspelled anyway. And now we have free J A. And that has a meaning in itself that is extremely important in our time. So I was so privileged to just kind of come across this amazing title to do what has become a series now. And this is the third installment. So this will be free J A version three. But to get to that, I want to show people how a jazz musician uh, studies songs and melodies and chords and harmonies and all the things that we study. So I'm going to play you a Brazilian version of a great jazz standard called Bluesette. And then I'll open that up. And then at the end of that, you will see how I sequence into, uh, based on whatever it is that I'm feeling from that ending and from that music, uh, into the uh, third part, part three of Free J.A. Tanto em tu corbuset, mais te vê, mais te sete. Com vinguém do bilimê, em cacotlém, jazz hall of fame, e tu também. Solo os milhos só pra mim, pra mais ninguém. Thank you. 
Yeah, it, let me just say this briefly, then I guess you go to the other piece, and that I felt that piece that was beautiful, and I'm sure the audience did as well. Today, just pardon me, um, the dental concerns I had to wear a mask, but let me just let you know my um, dedication here is because I would dare not, and I would dare not, I would feel it would be robbery to not, you know do the interview and make sh at this time and and that the audience would not be privileged to have an opportunity to um to experience what we're experiencing so far so i just want to mention that other than that i'm going to give it back to our guests and that was that was wonderful but who we might be in for some free jazz what we, what we crave well, Thank you. so I was going to tell you, yes. Um, so what I did was that was free. So, so what I did was I played the melody first. Okay. And the second, after I finished that melody, I segued into free jazz. Oh, okay. Well, let me ask okay. you this. Here's something right on the, right on the spot. Okay. Because uh, no, I was, yeah. Yeah. I was totally, I do yeah. I was going to say I was yeah. blown away last week, oh. blown away. And I'm a, I'm a, you know, a, what you would say, a, a high B jazz, I'm, I'm not a professional okay. jazz, a, a high okay. B jazz saxophone player and played piano. But what blew me, and so I'm a musician. So, mm. so you know, that's a new, unique level. So, so is it any way that we could request whatever Christmas standard you just want to give to us? Because I definitely going to mention, this is me. I have to mention, okay. I told him, to, that that we'll get it. That I'm going to put it down in the comments. How you can we'll talk about that later as well to to get his mm -hmm. Christmas album. But maybe he'll bless us with uh, um, a Christmas standard that that you know a part of it at least and just get a taste of that. Artist. Okay, let's do that. Okay. Thanks.
Wow. Wow. That was that was great. Now I, I said something, but was there something else that I think you wanted to do or you wanted to say something? I know I got anxious <laughs> and excited about the jazz, but was there something I think there was something you might wanted to say? Yeah. So yeah. all right, so now by the way, I can hardly remember that because it's July. I changed the chords to that, so I, I can hardly remember them. But I, I kind of, I hope you could kind of hear the reharmonization somewhat because I could, could, couldn't remember that song. You know, you forget, you have to, like, when I get close to Christmas, I have to re remember those songs because I changed them from the original. You know what I mean? But yeah. anyway, um, what, uh, what, I, what I was going to do that I think you were talking about was just do a short. Uh, free jazz just off the top of my head, not influenced by a previous song. So this is, won't be influenced by anything. And this will just be a, a, a small amount of free jazz that has no no influence from, you know, a previous song that I'm coming out of or going into or anything like that. Great. <laughs> Wow. That was, let me, I just have to say, that was spectacular. That was, it, it sounds, I, I, I like to think that I have a good ear, uh, music ear, 
that sounds like a hit to me. That I mean, you have to do something with that. That was, wow. That was, like I said, great. That was, I mean, literally, that was great. Yes. Okay, so let's move on. Oh man, you can stop the show now, but <laughs> but no, but but let we, we, this is for the young people, um, and for the parents and for 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 the older people, for everybody, for everybody. Tell us now, where did where where did you where were you born and where did you grow up? And I guess we'll get a sense of how that might have influenced um, the beginnings of a of a jazz legend. Well, I, I grew up in um, upstate New York in a town called Schenectady, which is near Albany. Um, and Albany is the capital of New York State, even though most people don't know that. Most people think New York City is the capital because it's, you know, such a big, famous city. But actually, the capital of New York State is this city called Albany. And Schenectady is maybe about 20 minutes away, 15 to 20 minutes away by car. Uh, it's a small town. It had um, some pretty good art people, although I didn't realize it at the time, um, but um, it, it had some good, you know, drama and uh, arts people. There was a guy named Mr. Brumba at my, at my high school who was quite wonderful, uh, you know, inspiring uh, person, uh, just really encouraged, encouraged all of the students, you know, all of the people he, he taught a uh, theory class, I believe, but, um, you know, for the most part, people were encouraging. I guess what was kind of a good, a, a good break for me was that my mother played the piano and she played the organ in church. Okay. And so my father, uh, at Christmas time, my father bought her a piano. Unbeknownst to me, this was on Christmas Eve, I was staying awake waiting for Santa Claus to come because this was the year that I was going to see Santa Claus. Because every other year, I <laughs> tried to stay awake. I tried to stay awake, and my eyes, and I just fall asleep. Next thing you know, it's the next morning. Oh, I blew it again. So I was really, you know, like really just holding my eyelids open, trying to stay open, you know. All of a sudden, I hear this loud noise downstairs and someone moving something and stuff like that. And so I kind of was peeking around the corner because if my parents saw me, they get very upset that I was staying up to see Santa Claus. You know, they wanted me to sleep. And we had done all of our little ritual, you know, so it was time for me to be sleeping. And this kind of large, heavy set guy came in. I guess he was moving the piano in, but I figured that was Santa Claus. So I said, <laughs> I thought Santa has moved some giant present into the house. <laughs> so the next day, you know, was Christmas and we came down. And there was a giant piano in the living room. And I figure Santa Claus brought that in. I better see what, what it is. He yeah, must, I mean, yeah. he, was, he must have gone through all that work for a reason. Must be yeah. some reason that he, you know, because this thing weighs a ton. So I sneakily was learning it on myself. I figured this is something I can learn this on my on myself. And nobody needs to know, really. This can just be my me and little secret. And I would kind of stand up and play the piano like this. And I would just play and listen and play and listen when nobody was around now. And um, we, uh, every Thursday, there was a, a, a cleaning, a, a woman who would come, cleaning woman, you know. I just thought of her as Florence. She was kind of, I just thought, I didn't really think of her as a cleaning woman. I just thought of her. Florence comes every Thursday, but she had come to kind of, you know, keep the place uh, from being a disaster with, because there were so many kids in our family. We had, we actually had five boys in my family. So you can imagine what a disaster they could do to a house. So she was, I think she was the one who kind of ratted me out without realizing it, because she didn't really know. I don't know if she knew that I didn't want anyone to know. I have no idea, but I <laughs> think that's how they found it. Because I was keeping it pretty secret, except, you know, uh, I was playing and I'm sure she heard the sound <laughs> and I think she told my mother, Hey, you know, your son there really has a thing for that piano, you know? So my son, my, my mother came up to me one day and she said, now, Ricky, um, would you like to take piano lessons? And I said, no, <laughs> that's what I said. No. And then she kind of left it at that. But a few days later, she told me she was picking me up from school and she picked me up and she drove me to a piano teacher's house. Okay. So like it or not, like it or not, I was in 
taking them to take piano lessons. And I think it was just a normal transition. They they thought they saw that I was, you know, doing that a lot. What was I doing at the piano? And I was, you know, sneaking all these notes in and trying to figure it out. So now that piano teacher, um, her name was Mrs. Rice. And she, again, was just such a wonderful lady. Um, she was such a nice lady that I really didn't want to let her down, you know. So I, I practiced kind of for her because I know I, you know, she kind of sensed or felt I could tell that she felt that I had musical talent. That okay. was her opinion, you know. She okay. was she was of the opinion that I was a I was a musical, and I thought she was kind of special. She felt I was a kind of a special student, maybe with special talent. I was picking up on that, you know. Right. That she really thought there was something up with me musically in terms of talent wise, and you know, right, possibly rightly so, due to the fact that my father had wanted to be a musician. He was a French horn player. Okay. And he was so yeah, he was so good on the French horn that mm -hmm. he won a scholarship to study with um, this guy Mason Jones from the Philadelphia Orchestra, who was considered you know the top of the top five French hornists in the in the world. You know, wow. So he he had he had a scholarship to study with him, and he was he would go to Philadelphia every couple of weeks to take lessons with the guy. Wow. And um, he went to um, he was at the top of his game. You know. Uh, when he was with um you know in high school and all that stuff so mm. some of his really good friends were mm. well-known symphonic players so he okay. knew the first first chair violinist in the toronto symphony he knew the french horn player in that symphony uh wow. he knew these guys in um uh another group called the canadian brass he was very good friends okay. with them. the canadian brass were kind of like the Beatles of classical music a little bit because they had broken out to the big time with their, they were a small ensemble, but they had figured out a way to merge classical with kind of, you know, popular melodies. And they had a entertaining kind of show that they would put on and they were so well known. They actually had their own airplane at one time. Wow. So, you know, wow. yeah, and you only heard about, you only heard about people having their own airplane with like, you know, real famous rock band or something but these guys That's were right. so they would come over when i was a kid and they would teach me little songs and i'd you know do stuff with them so uh wow. you know it yeah so it kind of went on and i wasn't that i really wanted to figure out the piano on my own that was still my thing it always has been probably still is <laughs> i probably will always want to be trying to figure it out but yeah. i didn't want to let people down who were you know i knew they were wanted the best for me and were teaching me classical music or whatever they could teach, you know? Right. So I would practice all that classical music, you know, mm -hmm. for her. And then I went on to other teachers, you know, there was a guy named Ray Bazinski who knew a little bit, who was like, um, knew, knew, uh, he was more of a functional musician, like would play key, the keyboard in bands, you know, dance bands and all kinds of different things like that. So he taught me some of that stuff. And there was another guy named Stanley Hummel, who was a well-known concert pianist, who I ended up studying with leading up to music school. So now, uh, by this time, I was getting, you know, I was actually my senior year of high school, uh, I was called out of high school because mm. there was a college, Schenectady Community College, that needed me to play in, the, um, in their jazz ensemble. So they okay. had a jazz ensemble, and, and you know, the best, the best piano player around wasn't in their school. The best, okay. you know, the best player in their eyes was this guy in high school. So how can we get this guy in high school over here to play in our ensemble? Wow. So they figured out this, yeah, so they kind of drafted me out of high school. So instead of going to my high school, I went to a community college, and they transferred those credits to high school so I could graduate. And then they transferred them to my music school the next year. So, wow. it was, yeah, it was kind of an interesting ride. It was kind of getting and i was getting drafted into other stuff too like um <laughs> you know my homeroom teacher his kids had a rock band he wanted me to play in their rock band to play the school dances my mother wanted to alleviate the uh church organ so she you know dumped me in the church you know take over <laughs> for her in the church so you know i was busy and yeah. then this other band this other band um they needed a keyboard player but wow. I was underage, but they were like, you know, they were, well, we're not going to tell anybody. And they put me in their band. <laughs> and so I was playing for, you know, in these grown up places, uh, right. you know, but I was only like 15 years old. Wow. And I even ended up going on the road with a band wow. that needed me 
Um, and that band was out of Savannah, Georgia. The only two times Ooh. I've ever been to Savannah, Georgia was to meet this band that was like a disco band. Okay. And the other time was when I went to play to the Savannah Jazz Festival and read the Jazz for Peace poem. Those are the only two times. But okay. The first time, the first time I took a 24-hour bus down to Savannah, Georgia to meet these guys, and they were playing all this, um, all the songs of the day, you know, chic and all the dance wow. songs, disco, like a disco song, but a band playing it. And they had gigs in clubs, and we were traveling around, and you know. So I was in a lot of grown up places before, no, without, without, have, without needing an ID because he's part of the band. We're not going to card him, you know, he's right, in the right. band. So, wow. so I just was real busy as a musician doing all those different kinds of things uh, hmm. before I even went to college. Wow. And then what happened, yeah, then what happened going to college was, um, you know, my mother wanted me to look at some music schools. And there was a music school I saw that had jazz and classical. And okay. that was New England Conservatory. Okay. Because I, I had developed as a classical musician, but, you know, I, I needed to study all kinds of music, in my opinion. And, you know, I didn't know how I, what, where I was going to go in terms of, you know, I wasn't sure I was, wanted to be a classical, you know, professional classical musician at all. So, and I was playing jazz myself, you know, in the, in the ensembles and all that, like I told you. So now there was this guy, Jackie Byard, at New England Conservatory, and I saw that name, and I thought, wow, I could maybe go there and study with him. That would be fun. That would work for me, you know? So right. I auditioned at that school, and they asked you to check something, and I checked piano performance. Right. Because that's what I do. I perform on a piano, you know? So... Mm -hmm. I went to there for the audition. They only wanted to hear classical music because piano performance to them only means classical music. So I played only classical music and I got in in the classical program. So now I was a classical major at New England Conservatory, but secretly I really went there because I saw that name, Jackie Byard. So <laughs> I started studying with him as an elective. And then and it kind of was a crazy thing. I was, I was like two things. I was a classical major also playing in the jazz department and also playing a lot in the city of Boston, which at that time had a lot of live music. So many different kinds of live music was just amazing. Well, let me ask you this real quick. Um, mm -hmm. With your dad, he played the, the horn. What was his influence? Well, <clears throat> basically, um, <clears throat> his father okay. was an accordion player. Whoa, okay, grandpa. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, in other words, it was a little bit of a lineage there because my grandfather, the story is he came from Italy on a boat, and okay. he, the only thing he brought was an accordion and a winemaking press to okay. make wine. Okay. So he somehow got these two things over to America, mm -hmm. and... um he was a very uh, wanted person in the Italian community in okay. upstate New York, you know? Okay. So, yeah, so um, he ended up uh, in these situations where basically, um, mm -hmm. you know, they would take him to these bootleg engagements, you yeah, know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, so somebody needed to bring the whiskey and somebody needed to play the music. You know? <laughs> right, this right. was in that prohibition era. Right, and, right. You know, this, this, right. I heard most of this from my grandma, from my right. grandmother, that, um, you know, my grandmother said they would, a uh, Bentley would come and pick up my grandfather. Wow. And then there would be a trailer in the back, right. and the trailer would have the whiskey. Right. And yeah, and so um, I know he was in. Early in the early part, he was in Rome, New York. Actually, the city there's a city called Rome, okay. New York. Okay. And he was a you know kind of a big deal over there. Yeah. And uh, apparently, a lot of people started making them godfather to their children. Right, right, right. Probably because they figured they would be protected because he was protected because you know he was you know those mafia guys loved his music and all that stuff you know so many right. people thought he was one of them. Right. And apparently right. the list, but here's the problem. You can't really be Godfather unless you have money. So a lot of these gangsters 
they can be godfather to a lot of kids because you have to pay for a big party. That's like part of the ritual. Like right, the right. honor, you receive right. the honor of being the godfather, but now you got to pay for the party. Okay. You see what I'm okay. saying? You got to pay for this big party for the kids, yeah. you know? Right. So he looks at this lit. Yeah. So he looks now one day at his schedule and it's like godfather on this day to this child, godfather to that child, godfather to that one. And he's like, this is going to bankrupt me. This is <laughs> it's an offer you can't refuse, but it's an right. offer he can't afford. Right. You know I mean? Right. Because he's not the mafia guy. He's the accordionist. Right. So no, no, what, 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 was, what was his, mm -hmm. his, what what do you think was his influence with music? Was it music back from Italy? What what yes. What okay. He and, played go ahead. He could play any ooh. song. He had an okay. incredible ear. But wow. you know, in those days they wanted Italian music because they had just okay. come here from Italy and right. they, you know, they had they already knew what they liked. They loved right. all these old Italian songs, you know. Right. Um those kind of songs. You know yeah, I mean? yeah. Okay, yeah. so now, now let's go. go now, now, so now, now, okay, your father choosing the horn and he was mm -hmm. influenced. What, 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 what was his influence connected to his, to his father? He wanted, he wanted to play Italian music on the horn. What was his influence? Well, your yeah, father? that's the thing. He was going in another direction. My father okay. was really going towards symphonic. Okay. Uh, French horn playing. And right. so uh, he, he was really interested in a guy named Dennis Brain, who was this incredible uh, French horn player who died at a young age, but he was a soloist. And so my father was often a soloist with these symphonies and things like that. Okay. So it was quite different. It was quite different. I mean, in other words, he was kind of carrying... He was influenced by by music by my grandfather, but yeah. he he was playing classical music. The French horn is really, it's really a major league classical instrument. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, you know, when you play French, you rarely see anybody play any other kind of music on a French horn besides, you know, right. Mozart and you know all of those all all of the great symphonic works utilize the French horn. You know, it's a right. it's a it's a very you know, special piece of the symphony, the French horn section. Right. So, yeah, he was a little bit different. And, um, but anyway, so, so that you have that lineage. And, and so, 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 so let's go to, to, to the mother who, who played the piano. What was, what was her influence? She, uh, well, she grew up in Florida, okay. a, a town called Punta Gorda, Florida. Okay. And, I think her influence was just uh, to learn, you know, she, she, I don't think she ever was interested in as a profession. It was okay. just something that, you know, she took lessons as a child and she learned and she had a facility and she had, she was capable. She was somehow capable, but she was not ambitious in that regard. You know, she, okay. she had okay. studied to be a nurse and okay. she was a great nurse, you know, yes. and she was, a really great mother because in those days they studied something called um, homekeeping, good, great, okay. good future homemakers of America. Okay. And she had she had won an award. Okay. A nationwide award mm -hmm. for the future homemaker of America, and she right. shocked every. She literally shocked everyone in the town of Punta Gorda. And this little town had like a ticker tape parade for her when she was like 15 <laughs> years old, winning this award yeah. as a future homemaker of America. You know, it was like a yeah. beauty pageant, but for homemakers. <laughs> right, so, right. Yeah, so that was her, her, probably her main interest, but of course she was also a nurse, but right. she was a capable musician as well. Okay. Uh, somehow she had become all three of those things. And no. um, she used to, just to tell you, she used to play the orchestra accompaniment for my father to play Mozart horn concertos. Wow. Which was just mind blowing. No, no, no. Oh, that is great. Now, was there any, because, you know, dad had Michael Jackson. He actually was a was in a in a band. He He had Michael Jackson. I remember dad and some some jazz a little bit and some music. Were there any 
like like vinyl records that your father had, that your mother had, that you heard? Well, you know, it, it's interesting because um, I didn't know about my father's interest in jazz because um, the jazz records were down in the basement. Okay. And upstairs, upstairs they had more the songs of the day, you know, okay. um, you know, uh, Tony Bennett sings Beatles songs or something like that, or, um, you know, our, uh, Simon and Garfunkel or, okay. uh, you know, those, those kinds of things, uh, popular albums, you know, m more popular albums. Uh, and the jazz records were in the basement, but what happened was I had a brother who played the trumpet Okay. and that brother was deep into uh, blue note jazz from the 60s okay. and it kind of inspired me because I, I didn't know as much about it and I started to see that wow there was really something to that music um, what right. happened to me was I, I was in a library one day and I accidentally opened a drawer and saw all these records and I was like who are these guys and there were <laughs> tons of them and they were all jazz music that was jazz it was all jazz and I started taking records by Coltrane and other people out of the library now and listening to them at home, trying to make sense of them. And I was like, I didn't care if I failed at making sense of it. It was because it was over my head. I was like, I'm going to try again and listen to it again and, you know, get more and more out of each listening, you know. Um, and my brother was into a lot of uh, Lee Morgan and those type of trumpet players from the Blue Note era. So then... I found all of these um, records in the basement. I realized that my father had also been into jazz. Okay. And that my father's cousin, uh, my father's cousin, he and his cousin, and, his, and the, like there was a little gang of these people that would go to the jazz clubs back when they were kids. So right. He was a little bit secretly into it. <laughs> yeah. and, and then I really noticed when I would see him at my performances, and I could tell there was a huge difference between his understanding of jazz and my mother's, who just had never, didn't know anything about jazz at all. You know what I mean? She was a capable, you know, keyboardist and, and pianist, but she had no exposure to jazz growing up. But my father did, and he knew how to listen to it. And so I was like, wow, I could, you, you know, how sometimes in the audience, you could hear somebody else listening. You know what I mean? When you're yeah. playing, sometimes you can look up wow, that guy is get, getting everything I'm doing. You know, he's catching it. He's hearing it. You know, I remember one time I was in, I was in um, uh, India and I almost started playing most of my concert to three people that I saw in the audience and they were sitting right in the front and I knew that they had all of this knowledge. I could just tell by seeing how they listened. You know what I mean? So in other words, my father was a classical French horn player, but he was a, like a secret jazz lover. You see okay. what I mean? Okay, yeah. And so yeah, I had yeah. to discover that. So I right. discovered it. You see what I mean? And my brother... Interest in jazz. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, um, that also, that also uh, became something that I started to pay attention to as well. But when when did it the combination of all of that and when, when did it hit you? I'm I'm really gonna I'm just gonna let I'm gonna be I'm gonna let I'm gonna become a jazz artist. I know that I'm a classical artist and I have that capability. But when did it hit you? Okay, I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna take the mantle up. When, when did that hit you? Well, here's what kind of happened. Um, I couldn't, my problem was I couldn't get away from the arts. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. I didn't really want to, yeah, so I didn't really want to study classical music because it sounded like a whole lot of work for a whole little bit that you're going to get after you do all that work. You know what I mean? Right, right. But I noticed, I noticed when I would play, let's say, Chopin, you know? Right. And I would notice you know, he would take a melody and a prelude and he would take one note and he would just just mesmerize you by changing the harmonies and, all, you know, these amazing things that they would do with the music. So I couldn't leave it. 
because it was there was there was something going on in there. There was something going on in that classical music by these composers. Not only that, but I could literally go into the 18th century, you know what I mean, with a yeah. piano. Like okay. I could journey to another century, you know. Okay. And I, I was like, what? I knew there was nobody else in my class that could do that, you know. What? Right, right. Like they couldn't because you go, you you start to study those guys, and next thing you know, you're in. You start to feel their world, their energy, the <laughs> time that they live, you know, all that stuff. So, so I couldn't get away from it, even though I wanted to, because it seemed like a lot, like I said, a lot of work for, I don't know what you're going to get at the end. You know what I mean? Like yeah. four, you'll still need four bucks for a cup of coffee after you do all that work, you know? So right. that was the problem. Then I ran into jazz and I'm like, okay. oh my God, what a big, what a big mountain this is to climb. But <laughs> Did you ever, did you, did you, did you, did you, did you, this came, I don't want to lose this thought. Did, did, did you ever hear your grandfather play? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. My grandfather played all the time, all the time. Okay. So he had gigs, he had gigs, even in his late in life, he had gigs um, at these little gatherings, you know, these little gatherings of old people or uh, the church. Sometimes they were run by the church. My grandmother would, you know, get him together and get, get his accordion. Somehow they'd get it over into the hall and he'd play for, but he would play after family dinners all the time. So I would hear him just all the time playing his accordion, like, you know, Christmas day, Thanksgiving, just any kind of, you know, out, outside in the backyard all the time. Did, did he, you know. did he have a passion and love for it? Yes, that's the thing. You know, you could tell that he was, he was, you know, the, they say, you know, if you have to do it, you know, it's the great, it can be the greatest thing ever if you have to do it. You know, I mean, most, most musicians, most artists will, will tell somebody, listen, you know, unless you really have to do it, don't, because there's, it's, you know, there's so much you can go through. But if you absolutely have to, play that music and learn it and follow that path. If that is your, if that's what you're meant to be, then go follow it. And it could be, it could be an amazing journey. And that's who my grandfather really was. You know, he, he was really, truly an accordion player, you know, and yeah. he wasn't, he wasn't a, meant to be a great improviser, all that stuff, but he was just a certain type of accordion player that, just brought joy to people playing any song in any key at any time. And he just loved what he was doing. And um, he was meant, it was meant to be for him. So that's when I realized that music could be something that you're just meant to do. You know, you can't, wow. don't fight the feeling. Don't try to run. <laughs> don't try to get out of it. You know, and I would all later in life, I would meet people who tried to get out, you know, and then they had to come back and then they had to make up that time that they were away. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Now now what about your your dad and your 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 brother? Did, did did they have a similar passion in whatever style they were playing? Well, my brother Joe was a jazz musician and he was an improviser and he was just all around, you know, he could do it. I mean, he was he was he was on a path. Unfortunately, he, he passed away in a, in a car crash, as did other, other music. It's really strange because you have uh, trumpet players like um, Booker Little and um, the, great, the great guy who played Cherokee, uh, one of the greatest of all. I forgot. Why, why can't I think of his name right now? But um, uh, they died in these car crashes, you know, and that happened to my brother, at, and, they, and they died at age 26. Oh. So Clifford Brown, Clifford Brown is the person I was thinking of. But I mean, there's like all these, there's this weird thing with these trumpet players, whiz kid kind of trumpet players that died at age 26 in a car crash. It's a weird thing. And my brother was one of them, but right. he was, um, you know, he was just a natural. He was a natural. So he had, I think he had my grandfather's like meant to be kind of passion with my father's like, Armbusher, you know what I mean, for right. just being so good on the horn. Um, so he really had something, and um, uh, so so yeah. I mean, it's hard to say 
with my father because he eventually went into law and he was not an improvising musician. So okay. it's a mystery. It's a little mysterious as to whether he, you know, was meant to be or if it was just something part of his overall excellence. You know what I mean? Okay, like right, that right. Journey he took to, you know, to really uh, become quite a French show because his friends, these guys were famous people in symphonies and they would pull me aside and say, man, your father was our idol growing up. You wow. know? So I knew wow. he was way up there in terms of uh, ability before he went and, and changed career path. D did you ever hear him practice? Well, the, the greatest thing for me, not so much practicing, because he, he, I didn't really hear him practice that much, to be honest with you. And I don't know if he even did, because he, right. he, had, he had already chosen, you know, made his decision with law in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, being a lawyer. But um, he used to play Mozart horn concertos in the living room with my mother playing the accompaniment. And <laughs> you just, it was unbelievable. Wow. Kind of forgettable. Yeah, you'll wow. never... You know the impression that makes is um, is incredible. Now, now, what about you? We're gonna get to you, but what about you, what about your mo mother? What was her love in terms of? I guess playing for the church. I guess that was a uh, icing on the cake. You know, the the, the pastors are uh, the priest is, is 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 pleased. The congregation is pleased, and it's and it's to God. You know, what what was her passion? What, what how did how what was her connection in love with it? I really think it was something that she could do. You know what okay. I mean? Like she didn't have an interest in, you know, going deep into the literature of pipe organ, you know? I mean, right. there's a composer, there's a guy named Mession who did amazing things as far as, uh, you know, organ works. And of course mm -hmm. you had Bach had amazing stuff and Brahms, I played some of the organ works of Brahms and they are just magnificent. Uh, you know, and Bach of course had some of the most famous organ pieces ever. Uh, but that was not her thing. She okay. was capable. That was okay. what she was. She just, she had it. She, she had the capability to handle it. You know? right, right. So she could go in there. She could go to choir rehearsal. They'd put the thing in front of her. She'd read it. The choir would sing. You know what I mean? So, uh, uh, you know, she just, she, she could do the, she, she could cut the gig. She right. could do now, when she stuck me in there, it was very different because any time that I had, any time that there was a like a, you know, a, um, like you just organ music is needed for these three minutes of organ music while the priest walks around, you know, he cleans the cup, whatever. He has to clean that cup. There's these little moments where you play something, you know, an offertory or after you play a hymn, now everyone's going to commune it and you just, you know, you, you have to keep the music going. I would make that stuff up. I would just make all that up. I would just, you know what I mean? I would just play what you say, free jazz, but on the organ. Wow. wow. And, yeah. And sometimes, sometimes the priest would just stop and say to the audience, you know, I hope you people realize how blessed we are with this amazing music. And he would just say something that would blow my mind. Cause you never know. I was, I was worried that they might say, you know, don't do that anymore. Right, You're not right. Because right. play. my mother would play a specific with the notes, and you know she would play something specific. You know the the the, and she would do that. That's what she would do, and they would know. But I was like, no, no, no. You're gonna give me. You're gonna let me just blow here. You're gonna give me like three minutes to just play. I'm just playing whatever I hear. I'm gonna just make this up now. And that was, and that, and that's what I lived for those moments. You know. Yes. The priests, the priests were cool, and I think what I would do is I kept it within a style that they could, you know what I mean? I kept it within the framework that it wasn't too um, adventurous. You right, know what I mean? Right. So I, I did what I need. I, I kind of, you know, I watched them while I did it to make sure everything was, you know what I mean? Was, was, was fitting. It was, it was right. fitting for the moment. It fitted right. to the moment. But the other thing was I would often come there literally wiped out because I would play these gigs on Saturday night with a band of grown-ups and we would play these other places until one or two in the morning you know or sometimes wow. we'd play, yeah we'd play some club or we'd play some wedding or we'd play some function and then we'd go to someplace else and then they'd bring me back at two in the morning and then i'd have to be at eight o'clock over the church you know so there was a couple of times i remember one time i did 
Um, I, I remember hearing the 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 guys say Rick, Rick, <laughs> and then I oh my god, I fall asleep. You know, so that yeah. did, that did happen once, and that guy was nice about it too. They they were very good. everyone was cool about it. So I, I was very I felt very blessed in that sense to get that musical experience. You know, right. and just have and I had these little chances to improvise. And everybody was cool. Everybody right, was okay right. with it, you know. Let, let, let me ask you this: when you became this, as I kind of sense this prodigy, this child prodigy in terms of playing music, when did you know there was something a special relationship, not just with jazz by itself, but you and music? When did you know that you personally had a, you know? a re personal relationship with music and something was going on. When did you feel, okay, there's something here going on with me and music? Well, I was a little kid once and yes. I was with my grandmother, my aunt Rose, maybe someone else. And we were holding hands and we were dancing around in circles to a right. Beatles song. And I think okay. it was, I want to hold your hand or ooh, yeah. I need your love or something like that. And I was, and I was like, this, we are having so much joy. This is so much fun. Like, it, it, I think I want to do that. I want to do what those guys are doing. You know what I mean? So I, <laughs> that was when I wanted to do music. And I, I, I was like, you know, that's fine with me. If I can just be the guy that does that while these people enjoy it, then I could make a whole life out of that. I could do that every day, you know. You know what I mean? Because, I mean, you know, you look around, there's so much tragedy and, and you know, people – you know, getting, you know, dengue fever and coronavirus as, as we're dealing with right now. And, you know, all these things that are so sad and everything. And I'm listening to these guys, you know, singing and we're like in a, dancing around in a circle having the time of our life. And I'm like, that, that's for me, you know what I mean? Like that's, I can, that, that sounds like a, a definite way out of all of these other tragic situations or difficult situations or adverse situations, you know. So, that was the first time that I was like, mm, I think I want to have something to do with what's making us dance around in a circle. You see what I mean? I just didn't know that the art, these art forms were going to pull at my soul the way they did. You know, it wasn't going to be a, there wasn't going to be the easy way out. I wasn't going to be able right. to take the easy way out because um, the art forms of classical and jazz uh, were really um, – you know they they were they were always there you know you know you could they were inescapable inescapable not that i didn't have my share of uh you know fun as a piano bar entertainer playing in all kinds of wedding bands and bands that just played you know the pop music of the day and not that i didn't have a great time doing all that but um you know the um the soulfulness of music the spirituality of music the creativity of music, the artistry of music, that was what was going to be needed in terms of fulfilling me and of, of terms of really the message I wanted to communicate with others. Okay. And let me ask you this. When you were in the, the prestigious school, I guess, undergrad and maybe master's, were there any, you know, with the institutions, where higher learning institutions, were there any interesting of musicians that came and maybe played for the class or came and visit the institution while you were in school? Was there anybody of note? It, it could be classical person, it could be jazz person, it could be rock, pop. Was there anybody interesting that came? Well, when I was in high school, mm -hmm. um, they had this guy come in and he, he played the drums. And he came in and he played like a drum solo and talked to us about the drums and did this, that, and the other. And I, when I saw him do that, I was like, wow, that's a way that I would like to teach when I get older as okay. a clinician. You see what I okay. mean? He comes right. in, he gives you something that's not necessarily on the uh, textbook. You know what I mean? Okay. He's bringing something else to the picture. And so when I, when I saw that, I was like, that is something I would be, I knew I would be interested in that. And 
you can never really get enough of those kind of gigs. They're not that easy to get, but I've, I've done them all over the world, but not nice. as much as I would like to, you know? I mean, I, 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 every time I did them, I would think of that guy and like, oh, here I am back where that guy was, you know? And boy, right. I remember seeing him do that. And now I'm, now I'm, gonna, I'm then going to have that fun. I'm the guy, because it looked like he was having a lot of fun, you know? Yeah. And we, Andy was giving something to the students that was above and beyond what they were already getting. So he was adding another element of knowledge, et cetera. So, you know, uh, but I've done that in places, you know, from McGill University, New York University, Hong Kong International School. Um, oh my God, there was a place I did it in Bolivia, La Paz, Bolivia, mm -hmm. La Paz mm -hmm. Conservatory, just different right. places. It would sound like a lot if I told you all the places I did it, but right. I can tell you it wasn't because I it, it's so enjoyable that I would have been glad to do it hundreds of more times, you know, if, if, with the opportunity. It, so I guess when that, I, now when I when I got to college, then there were named guys that would come in, that kind of name players that would come in, but they would do something very similar to what that guy did on the drums, but they would be named jazz musicians that you know special guests that would come in like that. Go ahead. Did any would there one or two that that influenced you that that you were fascinated with that came when you were in college well uh, let me think if there was one that was especially you know i'll tell you i found them all pretty much equally as interesting um but after school after school uh after i finished school and i was a musician um Someone invited me to NYU to see the master class of um, an amazing saxophone player. And I was kind of a little bit blown away by that one. Um, to remember that guy's name. Uh, okay. Let me just see. I could probably um, look him up. Okay. Uh, well, now uh, the problem is I, I know I can, I can tell you 10 of his compositions, but I can't, uh, I can't remember. His, Joe Henderson. Joe oh, Henderson. Joe Henderson. Yeah, and I just I just remember seeing his clinician, and it kind of stood out some of the little secrets that he has to to play, you know, to, of his of the way he improvises, and I, I thought that was kind of fascinating. But uh, no, it wasn't so much the the individual. It was what I what I kind of fell in love with was the 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 op opportunity itself you know what I okay. mean? the idea of it right so the opportunity itself yeah because uh you know even recently there's um a group called musicians for musicians okay and they did and they did that with me and they had this place on wall street that was a um you know one of those office places and they 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 had this uh kind of Senate a clinician or whatever, where I came in, I played for them, and then I talked about what I do, what they things that they wanted me to talk about. They wanted me to talk a lot about jazz for peace and how that works and all that, and then answer questions, you know. And again, yeah. it was the same. It's the format, you know. I kind of really like the format. I love the format of a clinic. I do. I think right. it's a very special addition to your, you know, your regular studies. Well, let's go back to the. Your school because I remember you said something last time that you were kind of like a reporter as a young person and you went to to talk you even went to to some clubs and were trying you were interviewing some you know famous musicians how old were you then and where were you then and what and tell us some of the the interesting adventures with that okay so well, this is kind of a funny story because um, I used to deliver papers down at this uh, neighborhood that was an Italian neighborhood. Yeah. And the place where I picked up the papers was right in front of a quote unquote luncheonette. Okay. Yeah. But they ran a number, they ran a numbers racket in there. And okay. so there was a, yeah. all right. So, so the son of this guy who was, you know, uh, they called them legs. You know, yeah. and so uh, the son of that guy, uh, he, I, we became friends because I used to pick up the, the, the newspapers right there and he was standing lookout 
he used to get paid a lot of money just to stand there and do nothing. You know what I mean? Well, One yeah. of those, like kind of, kind of a no-show job, you know, like yeah, I don't yeah. know who's going to come there, but he's there to stand there, do lookout, and they give him a lot of money, you know, weird things like that. Yeah. So uh, he, we ended up sit in the same class, uh, math class, and he had heard uh, that I had, you know, that I had chosen this as a thesis. Okay, so it's like your senior thesis or whatever, junior, it's probably my junior thesis because my senior year, was a, but it was a thesis that you're supposed to do. I never knew, heard the word, the word thesis, but you choose a topic and you do a thesis on that and you give it, it's your big deal, your big paper for the, for the, you know, for the year. And he knew that I needed to do that. And, you know, he's one of those kind of guys that, you know, things fall off the truck, you know, it falls off the back of the truck. You know what I mean? Like you need a refrigerator. Well, uh, you know, Sammy, one just fell off a truck. <laughs> you know what I mean? That kind of stuff. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I'll have him bring, let me, let me call Sammy and see if a <laughs> refrigerator fell off a truck recently, you know, <laughs> yeah. that yeah. kind of thing really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, cause I used to go out with this guy and we would go in the back entrance of right. the place and we never went in the front, you know, right, right. we go to, we go to a hockey game. I, what, what kind of interest is this? It's the way back entrance, you know, okay. and we have separate entrances and all this kind of weird stuff, uh, horse betting, you know, stuff like that. He, we go into like an office to bet the yeah. horses, you know, we're supposed yeah. to be, what happened to the window? You're supposed to go to the window. <laughs> Why do we go there? All this gooey stuff. So now, you know, all of a sudden what happened was a reporter's ID fell off the back of a truck with my name on it, <laughs> a picture of me. You know what I mean? So that's what happened. That's how right. I get this. And, it, you know, I couldn't, it was, you know, again, it's kind of like an offer you can't refuse because I can't <laughs> yeah, say yeah. no. I don't want to insult him and say no. I mean, this, this, he got me a pristine reporter's <laughs> ID. Oh, I'm God. You, nobody, he said, here, just take this. He said, you can get in anywhere. You're never going to have a problem. I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> never. He said, they'll let you right in. They'll take you wherever you want to go. They'll probably give you drinks. They'll probably give you food. Who knows <laughs> what you're going to get? You yeah. know, you're a reporter. Yeah, so yeah. I took that idea. I just did what he told me to do. I just did what he said. You know, I went to the, there was a club down in, down the, you know, neighborhood. I couldn't go to it because I wasn't of age. And if someone asked me for an ID, I didn't have, you know, I couldn't pull that off. If I show that reporter's ID in the door, I went, you know, and I would tell the manager, listen, uh, you know, I want to do a reporter. I want to do a report on, and, and these big names would come into this club through this club. You know what I mean? So for example, one of the guys I uh, interviewed was Earl father Hines, this guy, Earl Hines, and he was a big name in jazz and he had come through this club. And like I said, I went up there, I said, Hey, I'm a reporter, showed me ID, let me in, no cover. And I said, listen, you know, I, I need to interview Earl for the, you know, for the report. And they just treated me like I was, you know, I, I was part of the business, you know, of course, oh, of course, no problem. We understand. Let me take you backstage. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Earl, this is, this kid's from the blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? And Mr. Yeah. Hines was delighted to sit with me and talk and I write, take notes. As I'm taking notes for my thesis, you know, but as far as he was concerned, you know, it was a, it was, a, it was an article coming out and <laughs> I got, they would tell me everything I needed to know. I mean, it was unbelievable. And like I said, I would do it with other people like McCoy Tyner and, and other, you know, other names. I mean, I interviewed a lot of people. And a lot of the thesis was on Art Tatum, but he wasn't alive anymore. But I would ask them what they, what they knew about Art Tatum, how Art Tatum influenced them, these kinds of things, you know. And like I said, um, I was at one concert trying to get a hold of McCoy to interview him, and he just wouldn't get off the stage. He was playing for so long. <laughs> but the other guys were coming and going off the stage, so I started interviewing them. And the percussionist was this guy, Guilherme Franco. He was playing with McCoy Tyner, and I interviewed him, you know. Hey, can I? Well, sure, sit down, talk to me, you know. And uh, that was why when I was in when I was in Japan, and this guy said, "I'm, you know, I'm sending you, I'm sending." I told you about my friend Guilherme Franco. He wants you to play in his band. I was like, there must be a lot of Brazilian percussion players named Guilherme Franco because I know what I interviewed. Him. You know, he said, no, that's him. Yeah. So I had already, yeah, I mean, that, I, I'm sure he didn't remember, but I had already known him only because I interviewed him for that thesis when he was playing with the court time. And what was the, the time period? Was that 20 years later? 20 probably was at least 15 years later, at least. Yeah, you're right. Because, well, after that, I went to college. Then I was playing a little bit long. You know, I, I was play, I played in, see, when I was in uh, college, I didn't, there was a, a lot of like the mentality was 
you study in Boston, you know, and then you get your act together and then you go to New York, you know, right, that, New right. York is where all the pros are. But when I got out of college, um, I had these gigs. I mean, I, I was making a living and I was like, I was kind of like, listen, it ain't broke. Why should I fix it? You know, the phone's ringing. People yeah. are calling me for all kinds of stuff. And I'm not in a hurry to just leave that because I'm like, I, this is what I always wanted to be, a musician that answers the phone and goes and plays music with all kinds of different uh, opportunities, you know? So I was playing with uh, the Artie Shaw Band, which was a very well-known big band at the time. And I was also playing with a, a famous 50s group called the Platters. Okay, the Platters, yes. The Platters, only you. <laughs> I mean, they had like a ton of hits. And we were, I was going on these cruises with them and going to like all these places, Jamaica and, oh you know, my goodness. Uh, Mexico, yeah, uh, you know, Mexico and, and uh, Puerto Rico and all Whoa. that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, and then, and then the, the Artie Shaw band, they were like traveling in a bus all over the country. You know what I mean? And I'm only mentioning those two because the other ones, there's so many, I don't even remember all the names. Nobody would know who they are, but there are all kinds of bands. Like I said, the phone would ring. I pick up the phone, I where's the gig, and I go and I play. So right. I don't I was in a hurry to mess with that. You know, that was kind of if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of mode. Um and now, um, Gillespie, right? You said I think you mentioned briefly about Gillespie that you ran into. Well, him. that's another thing, right? That's the same deal. So while I'm in Boston, so now this is while I'm in school in Boston, before I even finish school. I'm in school and um I'm staying at this house. With the kind of a, a, a few, a, kind of a few little prankster kind of guys, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know how the, you know, you live in a, it's almost like a dorm room, but it's not a dorm room. You know, it's like, you know, these kids are, we're a little bit, the, the delinquency kind of, you know, juvenile. Like it's, you know, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, juvenile yeah. jokes that we play on each other, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. for fun. We play little jokes on each other. And I get this, if I pick up the phone, you know, and this guy's telling me over on the end of the phone. Now, here's what he's telling me. So I know, I know this is one of my friends. I just try to figure out which one it is. You yeah. know, I'm going to nail him too when yeah. I catch him doing this to me. This is not cool. Yeah. This guy says, hello. Is this Rick Dollar? I said, yeah. He said, uh, listen, um, I'm from the such and such club. And my father was just murdered. Oh, man. Just murdered. His father. Now, it was a club called Tinker's. I've never even been to Tinkers, but his, a guy, the guy who owned it was murdered. Right. It's crazy. And he said, I'm calling you because you, I got your name from so-and-so. I'm just trying to figure out which friend of playing this, you know, thing on me because he's, as he's talking, it's getting more crazy. It's getting more like, you know, because listen, we have these, we have these bands coming in and we need an opening act. And I, you know, I just, I, this guy gave me your name and blah, 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 blah. And I just, and he said, listen, um, you know, we've got, uh, we've got uh, Betty Carter coming in on the such and such day, and we've got uh, Dizzy Gillespie coming in on the such. Which one do you want to open for? And I want, if I could only knew which friend it was, I wanted to say, you know, you, you know what I mean? I wanted to lay it into my friend. <laughs> I could not tell. And the strange thing was, the strange thing was, I used to call that club and talk to this old guy about music because he was the only guy that would talk to me. Right. You know what I mean? Like pretty much, you know, like there's a few people that would like talk to me and, and like, listen, you know what I mean? Like genuinely like, and there's this old guy at this club. They'll say, now, where are you from? Where, what's your blah, blah, blah. And I would tell, what kind of jazz do you like? Blah, blah, blah. What do you like this? And I talk to this guy. And I was like, he's talking to me. I'm not going to hang up on him, you know? Right. And I'd have these talks with him and I'd call back again and talk to him again. <laughs> this old guy referred me to be an opening act for and you know what I mean? And I was like, well, when is when is the Dizzy gig and when is the uh, Betty Carter gig? Well, the Betty Carter gig was like five weeks down the road and the Dizzy thing was coming up in like a week. And I'm like, I don't know if your club's even going to be in business when the Betty Carter <laughs> comes, you know what I mean? Right, I'm right. jumping on the Dizzy Gillespie and I'd rather open for Dizzy, you know, I mean, just the idea to, I can't turn down a chance to open up, you know, be open after Dizzy Gillespie. So. Wow. I did that, and they again. You know, it's almost like there's these angels that we we can't forget about because I will tell you, there are so many. You know, almost these people like they seem like they're devils. You know what I mean? There's yeah. so many of them, and sometimes you feel like you're surrounded. But <laughs> this is like kind of a little bit angelic. Like somebody was like, "We're gonna give this kid a little 
Well, you know what? A helpful step forward, what Jasterpiece is trying to do. What I try to do with Jasterpiece, a helpful step forward. So these, that somehow that was like chosen to not only come in there and open up for Dizzy, but then the, they had, there was a dressing room. There was other dressing room for the band, Dizzy's band. I never even saw the, that dressing room. They had, a, they had, what had a dressing room just had my name and his name, Dizzy Gillespie and Rick Delarada. So me and Dizzy had the same dressing room and we would spend like hours in there talking, you know, just hanging out. Did, did you talk about music, life? What, 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 what can you share with the public that was interesting? And did you learn anything? Well, if you, if you, ever, there's a, there's a song I wrote called Cheeks because okay. Dizzy Gillespie played, had those big cheeks when he played. Yes. And um, uh, the great bassist Eddie Gomez had written the melody and he wanted me to put words to it. And if you read those words, that's what I learned from Dizzy Gillespie. Okay. So in, in those words, I mean, I, what I learned was, you know, things like, um, you know, that, that it was bebop that he had made his name in, you right. know, but it was not all, you know, instant success. In fact, um, you know, uh, a lot of the people that he admired at the time, basically, uh, you know, didn't, you know what I mean? They basically like, didn't want to, you know what I mean? They, I don't know how you could say, they kind of chopped it, you know, they, they kind of demeaned it, you know, they kind of just put it down originally, okay. you know? Um, and he, you know, he even told me that, you know, they, uh, some of, some people said it was, it was just a bunch of wrong notes. It was a okay. bunch of wrong notes, you know? And right. I mean, one of the people who was attributed to saying stuff like that actually was Louis Armstrong, who later came on board. But right. originally it was just too foreign. It was okay. just too foreign to, to these people. You know what I mean? Right. Um, it was just too foreign to them, you know? And right. they were like, it sounds like a bunch of wrong notes. You know, could be right, notes. Right. They're, they're playing notes that were not, you weren't really supposed to play because they're not, they're not in the scale. Okay. See, they're, they're doing it, they're approach notes. Approaching, right. they're approaching the note, the right note, but they would approach it from the, right. a half step below, a half step above, or a whole step and a half step below, or, you know what I mean? All these different kinds of ways of approaching the right note. Right. And that enabled them to use all 12 notes when they were improvising over any chord. All 12 notes they could use, which the other guys would never use those notes because they didn't know how to use them. You know right. what I mean? Right. So it sounded that way, you know? So I, I knew that, you know, that that was, uh, I knew that he had been through some adversity from, you know, just from listening to him. And, you know, like I tried to just, like, man, this is Dizzy Gillespie. Why? I, I'm just going to, like, listen, you know? I'm just going to listen, whatever he wants to talk about. I don't care what he wants to talk about. Sometimes, <laughs> he talk about. sometimes he talk about the new alligator shoes that he just bought. You know what I mean? We talk about that for a while, you know? Um, are, you, are you talking about his alligator shoes? We would, and alligator shoes, yeah, that he had what, bought. What, yeah. what, what did he say about the alligator shoes? He just was showing me, you know, Mom, I, I see, look at these new shoes I got. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we were looking at the, you know, the, the pattern and the thing and, and uh, he, how he likes those shoes. I'm just going along with it, you know. I just go along with whatever he wants. To, yeah. But, but, you know, as, as, as it was, you know, as the time goes by, you pick up this and you pick up that. And so I, you know, I started to learn that, uh, I, I mean, I learned that he was very, very, um, he had a very big heart for Latin jazz, Latin okay. music yeah. and Latin jazz. He had a really big heart for that. Um, he felt that that was an important direction that jazz was going to continue in. Um, and he, I, he was very proud of a trip that he took to Cuba. Okay. Uh, and he merged, he merged bebop with the Latin jazz, the, you know, the jazz that was not, it wasn't jazz. It was Cuban music. See, right. He took jazz and he put it with Cuban music and kind of started Latin jazz. You see okay. what I mean? That right. was kind of the, the the Cuban the rhythms with jazz see j his jazz didn't have those rhythms right. so those rhythms kind of came together on that trip he took to Cuba so I knew he was very proud of that you know right. things like that so those are the kinds of things I, I I picked up from him what was kind of funny was um my brother's birthday my brother was a trumpet player as I told you and his birthday was coming up. Or, you know, we were playing together and I was doing the thing with Dizzy and, and his, his birthday was coming up. So I, I got a 
I got a CD, which was on Pablo Records at that time. It was the latest CD. And I said, Dizzy, can you sign this for my brother Joe? Yeah. And he wrote something so interesting. He wrote to Joe, take care of your bro. Love Dizzy or something like that. Yeah. And I thought, wow. He, because he kind of picked up, I don't know, I mean, to say that, I mean, for me, because to me, that was very true, you know? Yes. To me, because my brother was such a great, like, inside player, standard player, and I was really more along the adventurous lines, although I could play any style, you know, I was more right. adventurous, you know, and I kind of, you know what I mean? He was like, he was telling, instead of telling me to take care of Joe, he was telling Joe to take care of me. Take care of your bro. Look out for me. You know what I mean? I just thought it was fascinating that he wrote that because it was kind of true. You know, I mean, yeah. uh, you know, my brother would kind of looked out for me a little bit, even though he was my younger brother. It seems, but I, you know what? I, I sense, I sense that um, there's a lot of things I sense, but let me just go here. I sense that, that Mr. Gillespie, whatever this, this is, Gillespie found something special in you beyond just a musician. He's, I think he, he, he sensed a future ambassador, which you are. Um, you, 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 you had favor also with, with the, the guy that, the older guy, that you, you were not only, you know, you, you were more than a musician. You were some, a, a people person and you were able to communicate and respect the elders. And, and so you were destined as you are now, you you were destined to go beyond just the just the musician, which is just to be a musician. That that's more than enough, you know. But but you you right. were to carry the language of jazz and music on. There's something he felt special about you to take care of you. That this guy has to push something farther. Another thing that I sense too uh, uh, about you, you 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 it's 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 like okay this is how it's done but let me improvise and go farther and then than what's going on and it seems like your whole life has 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 been that leading up to jazz for peace and then now we're finding out in this interview that you you were a great songwriter you know that you're a great songwriter and um you just seem like you were able to connect. I'm just gonna say a few more things, and I want to connect over to something else that I see. But anyway, that's want to jump right back to when you were in high school and you were doing these interviews. What did you learn when you were this reporter? What did you learn there from from? Were there anything interesting in talking to the, the percussionists and different people? Were, were there anything there at, at the at, before becoming a jazz artist in high school? Did you learn anything there through the conversations? Okay, yeah. Okay, so, uh, but just just to, just to sum up what you were saying, you know, the later, like years later, um, I was playing at a club in Boston just as I was moving to New York City, and I had my own weekend at this club in uh, Somerville, Boston. It's like a little outside of Boston, but it was a jazz club. And the guys, the original guy, the son of that owner who, you know, his father got shot, he came to that club to see me. And he pulled me aside and he said, I just wanted you to know how much Dizzy enjoyed working with you. So he was kind of saying exactly what you were just said, you know, and when you said that, I remembered him being at my gig, you know, coming out to see me play and, and telling me that, you know, and telling me that, that, you know, that, that he, it, he needed to take time out of his you know day to tell me that Dizzy, you know, what you what you were, what you were intimating with Dizzy. Now back to this other thing, uh, basically, yes. What I learned was that um, uh, one of the things I learned is that it's it's not an easy um, it's not an easy road. Okay. Okay. So I remember one of the guys. His name was Rio Clemente, and he was playing uh, at this club that I used to. And I went I went in with my reporter's ID and talked to him <laughs> or whatever, and. Um, and you know, he one of the things he said, he said what I what I told you earlier, he's the one who first said that to me. He said, Listen, um, you know, do it if you have to. 
he really wanted to implement into me, you know, do this if you have to, you know what I mean? Like, don't do it if you got, if you got two or three other things that you like. In other words, if you're, if you're feeling in life, eh, gee, I can't make up my mind I want to be either a musician or a doctor or a, if that's you, do, do be one of those other things is kind of what he really wanted to make sure I knew. You know what I mean? Unless I only had one thing and I had to do it, you know, so he's the first one who said that to me. So it was at that point that I realized, wow, you really have to need to be a musician in order to do it, in order to do, you know, you know what I mean? In order yes. to do that whole journey. When, when, did, did you feel something special in that moment when you, because now we can we can go to Dizzy Gillespie. Did, 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 did cause that, that's like the summation of going, I mean, going to the pinnacle basically. Um, cause they created a kind of a jazz form that's kind of like a rock form of the, a popular form at that time that 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 bebop that was huge. Um, right. Did you did you feel that hey, I I have to become a jazz artist. I just talked to a legend, and you know we talked about the simplest things and, and one man to another man about about his shoes. You know you can't get it. You can't have a a, a more simpler human conversation than that between people of different races, different backgrounds. Did you know then that, hey, I got to do something here. I, I got something here. I have to, you know, I have to be a musician, bare minimum, but I guess jazz, we can add that to the repertoire. What, 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 what did you know at that moment? Well, you know, on some of those nights, I would look out in the audience and I saw my teachers in the audience, you know what oh I mean? Oh my goodness! So I'm like, man, my teachers. Well, they came to see Dizzy. They probably were shocked to see that one of the <laughs> students, you know, or maybe they didn't even know I went to that school. I don't know, but I knew who they were. I was like, damn, my teachers are in the audience, you know, and I'm on the stage. This is crazy. So I knew at that point that, um, you know, I was gonna figure it out one way or the other. I was gonna go. I was gonna go in a musical direction. And I was probably going to follow the music that I had to play, not the music that might be the most convenient to make the most money or the this or that or the other. You know what I mean? I was probably going to, um, I was probably going to follow the direction of my development, and that was, and I, and I was just going to have to cross my fingers and hope because if those guys somehow crossed their fingers and made it to the finish line, you know, maybe I have a chance. You know, the other people have done it. I won't be the first. So, you know, let me see if I can, you know, but it, it was hard to turn your back on, you know, the idea of development, constantly developing, you know what I mean? So it, it was, um, it, it was a, you know, what do they call that? A, a something in a, you know, a, a gift and a curse or something like that. It was two sided because on the one hand, you know, uh, it's not the easiest road to follow, but on the other hand, um, you know, there's so much potential reward, especially when you factor in the opportunity to constantly develop. Definitely. Here we go. Now, let me see what you think about this. Um, what did it feel like two days? The day you graduated and family came which was a glorious day and the next day after. Now, school is, we're done with school. Now something has to happen. We know things, but so tell me about those two days. Well, uh, first of all, um, I, when I became a senior at uh, New England Conservatory, um, there was a composition instructor, jazz, great jazz pianist, great composer, and he had taken me under his wing too. His name was William Thomas McKinley and he was amazing. And he took me aside and he's like, hey, what are you gonna do? Are you just gonna go out and play? I said, I don't know, I guess I am. He said, listen, um, if you want, you can come into the jazz composition department and uh, I can turn you on to these areas where you can get scholarships. And if you want, you could probably stay in school for free or maybe even get paid a little bit of money to stay in school and delay this 
day of reckoning where you have to go and you know what I mean? Because one thing I noticed was uh, there was a gig office at the school where I went to and I would go there and take, I was one of the people that could do a lot of these gigs like lead bands and all different kinds of music. And a lot of, a lot of kids couldn't do that because they were very specialized and they wanted to be, and, and, you know, they wanted to be specialized for the, their, for their journey. You know, they wanted to be a uh, specifically play in a symphony or whatever. I could, I could see, oh, okay, this, this person need, they need this kind of band. They need that kind of, and I would meet with these, people i would meet with the bride and groom or i would meet with the meet with them at the school and play stuff for them they like okay we'll hire you you know and i noticed that when i played those gigs were way better than the ones i played for agents in boston you know these booking agents at agencies and they were like torturous sort of things you know they were just business you know and it was just you you felt terrible kind of after you did the gigs and it was just ugh, you had to wait three weeks to get the money, you know, it comes, they have to, have, I don't know where, it has to go to like a home office in Scottsdale, Arizona, and then up to <laughs> Seattle, and you know, your, your, your freaking check has to go on a tour, you know what I mean, wow. before it comes to you, wow. just crazy stuff like that, like just stuff like, like, wow, that, I definitely don't want to do that when I get out, I don't want to call right. those people, so I was like, hmm, let me meet with these scholarship people, so I delayed it two years, Okay. Just so I could get a master's and literally kind of get paid to get a master's. It didn't cost okay. me anything because he had kind of connected me with all these people with all these different scholarships and all these different things. So I was getting a, a this scholarship and a that scholarship. And, you know, when you add it all together, there was no, there was no money. It was no money to be paid and I'm still in school. So that delayed the day of reckoning for two years. You see what I did, mean? Did you take that time to, to, did, since you 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 had that that lesson, did you take that time to develop those two years while this was while you were studying, you you had money in terms of of school? Were, were, were you personally working on your craft, or, or, what, or what you were going to do music musically? Well, you, you know what, it allowed me to keep developing because I was developing all along. I mean, I was doing all kinds of gigs, but I was also playing in the jazz clubs and I was leading my own groups in the jazz club. And so it gave me two years to do what I was already doing, which was developing in many different ways. And of course it helped me to develop as a composer. And I actually did something for him. Uh, he had a label called Master Musicians Collective and it was recorded by the London Symphony and it's called Permutata. So I, I got to have a classical composition of mine recorded by the London Symphony. And that's wow. on the Jazz for Peace CD. Yeah, it was an amazing opportunity. And it was recorded at the Beatles studio. Abbey Road Studio is where Whoa. the London Symphony recorded a piece of my, it was a crazy situation. He just, something that had come into his lap where he was going to feature 18 different American composers. And wow. the London City was going to record all the pieces that was going to come out on a record on his label, Master Musician Selected. That was after I got out of school. That was that was a few years after I had uh, gotten out of school. But um, it, basically, you know, I made the most of those extra two years because I knew I had probably dodged a bullet by being able to stay in school because I was developing so much using the city of Boston as a, you know, testing ground for by playing in so many, any kind of band, any kind of music, all different kinds of things. You know, I was using it as a, it was a great opportunity for me to live in Boston with so much musical activity going on in Boston, you know? Um, I mean, I, I played in hotels and all kinds of stuff. So that gave me that extra two years. Right. And then now, really, I, now I was more prepared to yes. get out of school. I was more prepared than I would have been. So when that graduation day came, I believe they had Miles Davis come as a special emeritus or whatever. Yeah, he came on that graduation day. Did so you get like, a chance you know, to, get to it, talk to him? Uh, Did... Not really. I didn't okay. really get a chance to talk to him. I mean, I was kind of too shy. To, I mean, I could have. I was so close to him a couple of times. I could have said something. But I was just really too shy. I was kind of so in awe, you know, like, wow, yeah. Miles Davis. So, but and he didn't talk too much either because his voice, I don't know if you know, his voice is that... Yeah. you know so he didn't even say too much to anybody you know but he got a like a honorary they gave him an honorary degree that kind of thing you know that's a special thing. so but after that happened i mean it was I, I, I just got it i had to throw this mm -hmm. in real quick what's funny this is this is ironic 
I, you know, I'm coming from Georgia. So my parents, we went to Philadelphia for something and we was, we went somewhere and he had a free concert and I saw Miles Davis and I was totally blown away. So wow. at least we have, you and I have that in common. We, 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 we right. both saw Miles Davis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and well, when he came, when he made his comeback, I was at the very first gig because okay. he made his comeback in Boston a few years after that, and I was at his very first gig. But what happened was, it gave me two more years to get a li even more established in the Boston scene, so that when I graduated, the phone was ringing enough for me to just, you know, I didn't need to be in school. I, I was making a living. I, you know, I had. You know what I mean? Things were, things were okay. Right. In fact, they were they were so okay that it was. I was worried about stunting my further growth because I I knew I was going to need to go to New York. I just wasn't in a hurry because th I had a you know a cheap rent apartment and I had you know the phone ringing for all kinds of things from jingles to you know all kinds of of, of different types of jobs. Yeah, now you mentioned something. When did you start becoming a um, a composer? Composer was that it when you were in school, composing? Music? I started I started composing um, my own original pieces uh, as a teenager, and I actually went oh, to okay. a, yeah, and I actually went to a um, a music camp, and okay. the music camp because they really liked a piece I had composed that I had some of the other like jazz players play with me on uh, and they liked that piece. And so they liked it so much that they voted me most creative. Uh, you know, wow. there, there was like, you know, most this was, and I got voted most creative at that music camp, Bard College Summer Music Camp. So, wow. yeah, so that was kind of, you know, to get voted most creative, that's kind of a little bit of a nudge, like, hey, you know, you you better not stop because we just get, we just voted you most creative. So you better keep create. You better keep on creating. You know, that was kind of a, a little bit of a of a you know a subliminal hint to me. You yeah. know, to keep on creating. Yeah. But let me ask you this: the time you told me last interview, he said this this is such, this, I have so much fun when I interview. Is um you went you were over in Brazil. And you had some music and you said, well, I got these Brazilian greats over here. Guys, let's try this piece. Was that a piece that you composed? You remember that time? Okay. Uh, okay. Well, I think what you're talking about on that one, because when I, when I played in Brazil, I did bring my original music and the Brazilian music, musicians did play many. They lend, you know, their kind of own special interpretation to them. Um, so, uh, all right. So anyway, um, time I, what I was telling you about was, um, I had gone to this, I had been told to go to this club and fix this piano to get it in shape. And they're, they're going to give me 50 bucks and, and a ticket and dinner and stay and watch the show for Yvonne Lynn. And so I, I fixed up his keyboard. Then I watched him. And I was watching, and someone had called me before that, a woman uh, named Mausha, who was a Brazilian right. singer. She called me and said, this guy, Cizau, is coming to town, and you need to see him play while he is here. She told me about it. So now I see it already told me about it, so I get that one call. Okay, I got to find this guy wherever he is because he's going to be here this weekend because she just told me I need to see this guy play. Then I get another call from another guy named Zeluiz, and he's like, hey, get over to, they're going to pay you. You, pay, uh, you go fix this keyboard. We want to make sure the keyboard's right for the big star that's coming in. So I go over, now I'm sitting there watching the guy, and that's his bass player that she called me wants to see. I'm seeing him. He just saved this very first gig, and there I am watching him, you know. Now, I, the next day was a, um, was a jam session, and mm -hmm. I had a standard. I had a jazz standard. It wasn't an original composition. This was a jazz standard written by a bass player, and the bass okay. player named Steve Swallow. And it was a jazz standard called Falling Grace, and I had wanted to do it in a Brazilian way because I had been playing with all these Brazilian bands, and I figured I wanted to do a, a special type of arrangement of this piece. So I had this piece, and I brought the piece to the jam session, and they called me up. I gave that piece to the musicians. 
Well, he attended the jam session the next day because okay. he wanted to see what was going on in New York. So here I am. I watched him the whole night before, and I'm like, wow, I was too shy to go up and tell him how much I enjoyed it. So I just, like, blown away. I was like, went home, wow. He comes to the jam session, sees me. When he came, I was on the stage, and they're playing this Brazilian thing. So he hears me playing in his idiom because I had arranged it in a Brazilian flavor. So now the, is the quackiest thing. Instead of me coming up to him like what was meant to happen the night before, he comes up to me and starts saying how much he wants to play with me and how much he likes my playing and oh, he's blown away. You know, all the things I would have said to him, he's just saying to me, which made it very special because I was like, wow, now we, we can definitely, because I've seen you and you've seen me, and now we can make some music, you know? Yeah. And so that, but that was an arrangement. You said that was a standard, but you, that was an arrangement that you, that you I, put together. That was my arrangement. Yes, I was arranged. So that's the thing. When you're a composer, you know, you have two options. You can write your own piece as a composer. You compose your own piece, of course, which I've done so many times. But you can also take another song and rearrange it rearrange that song Com a composer is also lends itself to being an arranger by okay. being a composer it lends itself to taking another song and rearranging it in a way that <laughs> is special and that's yes. why that's why that that christmas album is special right is because, of, because of the arrangements i arranged all the pieces differently wow Mm -hmm. I, I definitely gonna recommend everybody. I'm getting it myself, but I'm gonna recommend the audience. Everybody, go get that. That we'll we'll get to that later. It's, but, it's funny <coughs> because we recorded it in one day. We recorded the thing in one day. Wow! Wow! Yeah. Now tell me, because we back to that question. Mm -hmm. What was what was your graduation like after the two years? Did you did your family come for the graduation? They did. They came. What was your, um, Was your grandfather there? Oh, yeah, still alive, he, your grandfather? Oh, no, no, no. Well, my grandfather, I think, <clears throat> came to my... See, I had a bachelor's and a master's, right. right? So my bachelor's, they came. My grandparents came to my bachelor's because uh, not the graduation, but the, um, the recital. Right. The recital. See, if you're a classical major, you do a, gra you do a, a recital to graduate. Mm -hmm. You have to do a recital. So I remember them coming to the to the recital, and it was so nice that they came all the way. I just thought it was so so nice of them to you know travel all that way and you know they're old at the time and all that and come in and, and see that recital. And so, your your, bro your brother was there. Yeah, I believe so. I believe so. And I mean, your, your mother and father and some more relatives sure. were there. For yes, and then my for sure my mother and father and for sure some so, relatives. What, too, what yeah. was that experience like? Did you see any tears in anybody's eyes from the family? Um, you know, I'll tell you. Um, it was the music was so hard. It was a classical program, and I was just trying to make it through. You know, but yeah, I right. know they were proud of me. I know they were proud of me. But I was thinking to myself, boy, you know. This is only, this is not, to me, it's not a big deal because I don't have, I got to go make a living with this craft. Do you know what right. I mean? And it's not guaranteed, you know? Right. You don't just, it's like if I was graduating with a, let's say a doctor's degree or something, and I was going to go straight into a hospital and make $80,000 or whatever, a hundred or right. whatever they make. If that was going to happen, then I could, then I could feel what you're talking about. You know what I mean? But see, to me, I felt like I was only at the beginning of the journey. Right. I, it wasn't really an achievement because I still needed to go out and find my way in that world that right. you know is unpredictable. Yeah, but I mean, but when did it, when you considered that was a beautiful occasion? Um, because your family was there. Now let me just, well, let me do, let, let me I, let, let me, yeah, let me show you how. Hum, go ahead, go ahead. Go I ahead, want to talk. say let you see how blessed you were. Because okay, okay. when I came, uh, I came out 92 from college, Morehouse. And 91, my grandfather died. And wow. he had a third grade education. He was a farmer from Elberton, Georgia. And he would tell me, you know, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer at the time. That didn't happen. But, but, but anyway, he, 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 he said, 
whatever you do, son, make sure that you, you, you're the best at it. That was one of his sayings. Mm. And it was just sad that he died 91 and he, and he and my on my mother's side, my, my my grandfather, my grandfather lived to about when I was three years old or four years old. My mm-hmm. grandmother passed before even my mother and father were married. Um, my grandmother and my mother on my mother's side passed when my mother was 14 years old. So the only grandparent oh. I knew was my mother's father, and he died one year before I graduated. So that's what I'm saying. It, from that standpoint, I hope you see right. what a blessing, especially the grandfather who, who was the accordion to see right. his and your and your brother who was mm-hmm. also a music person. And, and just everybody. I mean that was a, a that was a that was a blessing. Yes, you're you're absolutely right. You know, here's the thing when you're a kid um, you don't realize how lucky or unlucky you are. You know what I mean? Because you only, you don't have much to compare with, with, with your, right. you know, you just, well, that's your family, you know? But um, now in hindsight, I mean, I was just incredibly lucky uh, with grandparents, you know, yes. just unbelievable uh, with grandparents and with aunts and with uncles and all that stuff, you know? And so um, because they had that foundation, you know, uh, you know, it, it just, it bled into the whole family. And then I was just lucky with everybody else as well. And of course, you know, to have a mother who had won that uh, award for housekeeping of America, you know, I was just, um, you know, you know what, if you're born with all that and you don't give back, something's wrong with you. Yeah. That's the way I feel. It's well, like, this. I should give back. I, I need to give back because I was very, very blessed. Yeah. And there's, you know what I mean? It's like, I better give something back, actually. Yeah. How can I, I almost forgot. And this is a question I used to ask the book authors. And you're going to be one. It's coming. <laughs> but, 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 um, do you remember of your different, your mother and father, maybe something that you remember your brother said that any of your grandparents are, were there any famous family sayings? Like I told you about my grandfather. My dad would say, uh, uh, "Don't give anything, anybody, any any reason the same thing bad about you." And now, this is the first time I'm sharing this with you. My mother would say, "Do things," and she's still alive, 78 years old, bless her soul. Do mm. do things in moderation. So all mm. of these. So were there any famous, uh, in, any famous? family sayings by any of your family members that that stuck with you well you know my father was very intelligent and right. so he would say the, these kinds of things but not in a saying sort of way not in a you know in a saying sort of way my but my mother she had all those little snippets i don't know where mm-hmm. she got them but she had all the little snippets probably part of her upbringing or something. So she would say those kinds of things like, you know, well, of course, there's always do unto others as you would do to, uh, you know, as you would have to them. That's from the Bible, actually. But but she would also say things like, um, you know, if you don't have anything good to say about somebody, don't say anything at all. Uh, wow. you, know, you, can, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. <laughs> that was one of hers, too. And... Yeah. Um, there's a handful of other ones. I'm just trying. I don't know if I can remember all of them, but but there was, they, you know, she had quite a handful of those. Did, did, did your grandfather? Did you remember him saying anything? I mean, well, he, he, was my, was a, he was a success. He was a neighborhood success, and they loved him. He was. He, he, it, it got so. I guess you said the the the, the blessing and curse. The blessing with everybody right. wanted want him to be the, the godfather. The curse was like, right. hey, I I can only. Gotta, there's only one of me. <laughs> right. Well, you, well, yeah. You, the the curse is you got to pay for the party because <laughs> they usually it's usually a, a mafioso that gets those gigs. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, and then yeah. they have plenty of money, and it's no big deal. It's right. an honor, and it's an honor, and no big deal to pay for the party. But yeah, he was he was getting gigs that he couldn't afford to pay for. But right. um, but but basically, my mother's father, he, and that could be where my mother got some of these things from. Uh, he had a lot of them too, like a place for everything and everything in its place. You know, things okay. like that. Uh huh. Um, yeah. Do you remember uh, anything from your time father? And, time and time and tide waits for nobody. That was one okay. of those. 
time and tide waits for nobody. He had a bunch of them. Uh, now, my father, uh, on the other hand, um, yeah, he wasn't big with sayings. He wasn't big with sayings. But he did, um, you know, he, he would he would be able to get that message across to you, but using his own words, you know what I mean? Okay, to be okay. able to get a message across to you. I mean, he was perceptive. He right, was very right. perceptive. So sometimes you had to, sometimes you take what he said and then let me see maybe what he means by that. You know what I mean? He would be kind of perceptive. So you'd have to take it and then, then figure out the meaning. Right. Do you remember anything from the grandfather? I mean, I, I'm in, I love the grandfather. Okay. So that grandfather, he spoke mainly Italian, very right. little. What, but, but what he used to do was he was so fascinated that I wanted to learn about the old times in Italy, what it was like growing up in Italy, what it was like there and all that stuff. So he would speak in Italian and my grandmother would translate it. So she translated a lot of what he said. She would just okay. translate, you know, what it was like on the boat, what it was like coming to Ellis Island, all that kind of stuff, you know. Um, but I'll tell you, my grandfather taught me a lot with his spirit, Okay. with his spirit, because, you know, he was just such a giving man and such a right. wonderful man. You know what? He was the kind of guy, boy, did I not want to let him down. You know what I mean? Right, right. One time, one time I threw a bottle and he smacked me and he said, what's the, what, what's the matter for you? What's the matter for you? You know, like that. And yes. I knew that was wrong. I shouldn't have thrown that bottle. It broke. You know, yes. I shouldn't have thrown a bottle. I was wrong. And yes. I was like, oh boy, I'm never going to, I don't want to let you, you know, I, you know, it's like, it's, you know, when someone charms you in such a way that you are, I am not going to let this man down. I don't care what it takes. I don't want to let him down. You know what I mean? I want that man to be proud of me. You know, that's just the way I felt about him. He was just, he was just somebody that was so warm and so powerful and so great that you just, you know, I just, there was so much love coming from him that I just never want to let him down. That man deserves nothing but from me but joy. You know what yeah. I mean? If I could give him anything, I, I'd be a plus. Anything right. I want to give to him, because he, he deserves so much plus. What, right. There's not enough good things in the world that he doesn't deserve. So anything I can do to good, I would want to do in a minute. That's the kind of person he was. You know what yeah. I mean? He didn't have to speak. He didn't even have to talk to me. It's just like, boy, I'm not going to let you down today. I'm not going to do something <laughs> that you don't like. You know, just not going to do it. No way. Whatever I do, it's going to be something that you, you know, you like or you think is good. The last two, we just get this in. Now, what with me on that? What, what? Now, what about the grandmother? Did, did your 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 um, grandfather's wife? Was, was there anything you remember about her? Well, you know, I so because I had two grandparents. Remember, the, the other right. grandparents were in Florida, so I didn't see them as much. Right. But like I said, the the Florida grandfather had all those sayings, which yeah, was quite yeah, interesting. Yeah. You know, a place yeah. for everything and then time and tide and all those kinds of things. He had a lot of them and they were kind of entertaining. And his wife was a warm, wonderful person, kind of like my mother, you know what I mean? So his wife kind of had a lot to do with why, probably why my mother became, you know, the great woman that she was. But now on my father's side, that, that, that I could see them more often, especially every weekend I would see them because we would go there for, you know, Sunday dinner, you know, and um, that grandmother, she was, you know, like, I noticed that she was always trying to give us, like, whatever was going to give us the boost, whatever's going to make us, you know what I mean, better, stronger, but like, you know what I mean? Like, like, she wouldn't let me, she wouldn't let, she wouldn't let herself be, like, we play cards, you know, right. and I'd catch her, if she had a better hand than me, she'd hide the card. Because I had to win. You know what I right. mean? She always wanted me to win, you know, because yeah. she wanted to instill that winning. You know? So what I, you know what I got from her? Sacrifice. Okay. Sacrifice. She wanted, she was going to, whatever, whatever plan she had, it was to our benefit. Right. Not to her benefit. Right. Always to our, always to the kids' benefit. She was doing it. She's like, she's doing everything for us. 
you know. Wow. Just couldn't believe. And her husband, because my grandfather got Alzheimer's, and man, she took care of him like, like you can't imagine. You just can't imagine anyone doing a better job than she did. You know. Wow. It was amazing. So well, now maybe. Some people might say I only saw the good side of them because they're grandparents. You know, I didn't see them every day. Maybe you could say that same with aunts and uncles. Maybe I only saw the good side, but you're probably right because all I ever saw was the good side from these people. <laughs> I never saw anything bad. I mean, I knew they had, there were faults in certain areas. I knew my one uncle had an alcohol problem. I knew there were faults, but right. you know, they they never to me they were always like. You know what I mean? They were just any little bit they could do, even if even when it was sneaky, even if I didn't notice, <laughs> to give me more confidence in life. They would do it under the under the you know what I mean behind the curtain. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Now tell tell me now what about your your brother? I know that you you probably with that we, we, because of jazz and we're gonna get to some stuff. But tell me about about him. What was special about him the one that was the artist? Well. He, first of all, he was kind of a natural. I mean, he had a golden tone on his trumpet. And, um, you know, he, uh, like, literally, I happily gave him the, the, the first, you know, the, 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 the spotlight in a sense, because, you know, with that spotlight comes, like, I don't know if you ever, did you ever see The Sopranos? I've seen parts of it. Okay, yeah. this I don't know if you'll be able to make the correlation, but in the Sopranos, like, like the real the real head of the of the family was Tony Soprano, but the head for the police to know was Junior Soprano. Now right. they wanted Junior to be the head because if he gets busted, you know, you know what I mean. It doesn't. He's not really the head. They don't really have the head in print, you know. So blah, blah, blah. Now you know. So he wanted. Look, my the point is Tony wanted to be behind the shadows a little bit. You know what I mean. I was kind of happy in a sense to be a little bit behind the shadows with my brother. One, because he was uh, just a fantastic trumpet player anyway. You know, he had a golden touch and he had, he was a natural. He seemed like he could read anything. It seemed like he didn't have to practice and he still was great, <laughs> you know, and he was always listening to jazz and making little tapes and all that stuff. And all that was fine. But what comes with that is, you know, He's got to do this. He's got to go and play in the church, the, you know, the, the, the kind of dumb little hymn. But, you know, he's got to <laughs> wow the people there. Then he's got to go wow the people in the, you know, the Empire Youth Orchestra. Then he's got to do this. And he's got to do that, you know. So he's a little bit of a, um, it's a little bit of a, um, like a, a, a medal, you know, on your, you know what I mean? A little bit of a trophy, you know, like a trophy wife. You yeah. know, there's a little bit of a trophy, a little bit on the trophy child, a little bit. You know what I mean? Okay. And rightly, and rightly so, because right, right. you know he he was he was every bit as good as you know you would be. You know what I mean? But um, so I was kind of okay to be a little bit like, because I could, I just, it was a little bit less pressure on me. You okay. know what I mean? Okay. A little bit less pressure on me. But he delivered. I mean, he got into Juilliard. You know, wow. he got, You know, yeah, he he crushed it. You know, but like I said in my opinion, a little more pressure on him. Now, I felt pressure just that I was putting on myself, you know, right. to succeed, you know what I mean? And Because I felt like maybe if I don't take, if I don't do it, no one's going to do it, and no one's going to help me. If I don't, you know, I'm going to have to get there on my own. I'm going to have to do all that. So I, I did feel the my own pressure on myself. But, um, you know, uh, he was a, a little bit of, you know, like I said, a centerpiece. And with that comes, you know, some pressures and stuff like that. Um, but um, he was fun to play with, boy. You know, I remember sometimes I would come back for like a little, like on my father's birthday, put a little band together, you know. <laughs> my mother would hire, you know, she'd hire like a band and I would right. be able to be in it. She's like, hey, here's, the, you know, here's the, you can, you know, you can hire, hire a bass player, hire a drummer, you know. And then, you know, hey, Joe, come on in, you know. And, and it was fun. It was fun. It was great. Um, just a lot of, you know, he here's the thing. He kind of looked up to me. So okay. he's kind of following my path right. in music, but he was being pulled away on this trumpet star path, you know, okay. more because my father knew my father had his path. You know, see my father had had a different path than me because I was mm. improvisation and all that. So 
there was a little bit of, you know, my father had him studying with these top porn players from the New York Symphony and all that stuff. Do you know what I mean? So it was a little bit of uh, yin and yang, you know what I mean? Because to follow that path is a lot of pressure, you know? Right, right. To follow my path, to follow my path is a lot of uncertainty. Okay. But to follow that path is a lot of pressure. But okay. If you, get in the, if you get in the symphony, you have a job every year and you have all that, you know what I mean? Mm, right. But, at the same time, what if you're not meant to just play other people's notes your whole life? You right, know what I mean? Right, right. Then that could weigh on you, you know? Yes. So he, I think he was a little torn. And, um, you know, uh, so, so, so that was kind of the situation. I mean, I think he wanted to follow my path artistically, which came with uncertainty. But my father wanted him to follow that path, which came with maybe a, a symphony job or whatever. You know what I mean? I don't know. Right, right. right. You see what I mean? Both of them, both of them had their merits. Yeah, both of them had their merits. I was gonna say, right. so, so when you um, let's go back to when you actually um, so how was the graduation? And we're gonna get to the professional but but how was the graduation at the masters now who who came there the mother and father who came there yeah i think the graduation was mother father you know maybe a couple of brothers something like that something like that not as many people that came to my recital you know and because how did that feel all... how did that feel um you know it was nice it was nice to me. Um, it wasn't, you know, it was, again, I didn't really feel like I had achieved. Um, I didn't feel like I had achieved all that much just okay. because I didn't have a job to go to the next day. You know what okay. I mean? I still, I was, you know, I, I mean, my achievement was, you know, okay. I've, I've become a versatile musician, not necessarily because of school, you know? I've studied some cool things at school, but I be, I've become a versatile musician just by, you know, the school, the university of the street. You right, know, right, me. right, yeah. You yeah. know? So this was just another day for me. Uh, it was just another day, you know, family was coming and, uh, I felt a little responsible, you know, just to make sure they, you know, have a good time or enjoy themselves or whatever. Um, but I wasn't playing my music or nothing, you know, I had okay. to dress up. I mean, yeah. you know what? I really didn't like dressing up unless I was playing my music. It's like, okay. I get all dressed up if you're paying me, but I'm yeah. going to get all dressed up and I'm going to go down to this thing and listen to all these people talk and, you know, you know what I mean? It was like, yeah. it wasn't like, it, to me, it was an obligation. You know, right. I wasn't going to miss it. I wasn't going to miss it because that's not cool. But, right. you know, it was an obligation. And it, I want, you know what, if my parents felt something for it, then great. In right. other words, I hope somebody was getting something out of it. You know, for me, I wasn't getting a lot out of it because I hadn't really felt like I had per se achieved anything. Because what do you do with those degrees? Yeah, but, but but were they happy that day? Your family, were they happy? I believe so. I believe okay. so. I'm sure there was okay. there was there was no reason for them to not be happy, right? right. I right. mean, I, I bet they were a whole lot happier than if I hadn't graduated. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, I, mean, there's, yeah, I, I guess the good news about that day, there's no reason for anybody to not be happy. Right, right, if right. You're, if you're a little happy, cool. If you're medium happy, if you're big time happy, that's cool. As long yeah. as you're not unhappy, yeah. I'm happy. You know, right. I was basically happy because they were happy. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Like you're happy, cool. I'm happy. I'm happy now because you're happy. So what? From now we're at the point you came out out of school and you were to be honest, you were actually a professional back when you were in high school. And then right. there was something special about you as the reporter. You were convincing to go in there. Yeah. You were you mm -hmm. you were persuasive, convince. This goes, this ties it, believe it or not, think about it. It ties all the way to the United Nations. It, you, you were convincing. You, you had mm -hmm. it then as a kid. And um, let me, now your, your brother played with you when you played, when you did the opening for, for, for Gillespie? No, 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 no. 
what happened with the Gillespie thing was his my brother's birthday was coming up. So I think that you know, it, like like this was during maybe April or something that I was his opening act. You know what I mean? Yeah. And his birthday, or it could have even been the beginning of May. But my brother's birthday was May fifth. And right. I knew it was coming up, and I thought, what better to give my brother for his birthday than a signed record from Dizzy okay, Gillespie? Okay. This is okay. going to be great. So yeah. that's why at the, on the last night, I went up to Dizzy, and I said, hey, you know, my brother's a trumpet player. I might have already even told him that. I said, you know, my brother's a trumpet player. I was telling you about his birthday's coming up. Would you, you know, can I give him a sign? Yes. And that's how that happened. So, yeah, he, he didn't, because he wasn't in Boston at that time. He right. was too young. Yeah, yeah, he was too young. And he didn't go to Boston anyway. He went to school at Juilliard. Right, right, right. Now, mm -hmm. how many how many days did you play or nights did you play with Gillespie? Well, it was like week long engagements. So you know, well, like whatever Monday through Saturday, something like that. Wow. So you really had time to really spend time with him. We did. It was a lot. Of, it was it was a lot of time. I mean, you know, it, it came and went. I mean, if it was if it was anybody else, I would never speak of it. But because right, it right. was Dizzy Gillespie. You know, I have to, you know, it's part of my resume. I mean, it's part right, of my right. resume. People wanna, and people want to talk to me about it, you know. Of and, course. And people want to write songs about it. People want to know. But, yeah, it was just all of us. You know, listen, first, listen, I went from thinking I was receiving a crank call, you know right. what I mean, and trying to figure out which one of my friends was playing this joke on me. And right. basically, hey, that's not cool, you know, to do that. Right, right. You're over the line here, you know, posing right. as a club owner. You know what I mean? I went from there to like, here's your dressing room. And Dizzy's in there, sitting in there. Yeah. Go in. Go in and hang out because you got to get ready for your show. It's a dressing room. And the two of us are just the two of us. How, how, how old were you then? I was 19. 19 years old. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. So yeah. oh amazing. So now we're finished with grad school. How did what happened then? What happened after after now now the school is over with and now it's time for you to 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 chart your path. What how, what tell me about how did things and I see seemed like things were happening anyway, but you said that you really developed in Boston. And I guess at some point you made the transition to New York City. Tell us what happened in, in, in that time period. All right, so here's what happened. So basically, like I said, I'm, I'm playing with a couple of well-known groups. I had told you, Ari Shaw and the Platters. But I'm also playing in every Tom, Dick, and Joe's band, you know what I mean? And every now and then I have my own gig as a leader. And I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm just going along, you know, playing gigs, you know, just, I'm just, you know, letting that roll, letting the phone, letting the phone ring taking the calls, going to the things. And then um, one day, uh, a friend of mine, I had a friend who was, we he played in a band. Uh, this was a band that played at colleges. Okay. And I had done some gigs with them and they were fun, fun gigs. And they, we were playing kind of jazz things, but more into like Pat Metheny, Chick Corea range where it wasn't like a swinging jazz. It was more like, you know, Latin sounds and stuff like that with that the college kids were into. And these college, we were having this a lot of fun playing these Anyway, he, um, he's living down in New York city. He had gone down. Okay. So somehow we're talking and he's telling me about this loft he's staying in. It's a pretty big loft. And he's like, yeah, you know, if you want to come down and just check out the city for a couple of days, you stay at our place, stay at my, you know, stay there. We got to play, you know, just sleep there and, and just check it out, you know? So I come down to just check it out. That's all. I come down, I'm going to go two, three days and I got to go back up to, you know, up to Boston. But, you know, I had a three day, three, four day stretch. I could come down, just, just, just go around, just, you know, basically loiter around New York city and see what it's all about. You know, I'm walking on the street, I'm walking down the street and somebody says, Hey, Rick, and I'm like, you probably talk, you must be calling another Rick. Not, you know, you know, I'm looking to see who's the Rick that they're calling, you know, <laughs> looking to see who's the, Rick. And then finally I turn and it's someone I had gone to school with. Okay. In Boston. He was right. in New York. Right. And he starts talking to me and he's telling us, so what are you up to? He says, well, and here's what he says, like, this is kind of crazy. I'm like, so what are you up to? And he's telling me, well, I got this, uh, we have this drummer and this bass player 
and the drummer has a, a job. He's like a, you know, a little bit of an executive, you know, who plays the drums, you know, one of those kind of guys. Like yeah. he's got, he can afford to be a starving artist. You know what right, I mean? Right. He's, he's got a, he's got a big, he's got a job making some money. So and yeah, and the guy's got a studio and he wants to record. He wants to do this, blah, blah, blah. And uh, yeah, he says, uh, you know, um, all we need is some original music and a keyboard player. So I'm like, oh my God. He said, I said, well, he said, what are you doing? I said, well, you know, too bad, too bad. I'm not living here. You know what I mean? I said, well, yeah, that sounds great, but you know, it won't be me because I'm, I'm just here for a few days and I'm blah, blah, blah. He said, well, listen, can you come over and jam with us? We'll set up it up for tonight, you know, or something that night or the next night. You know what I mean? So now I'm like, okay, I love it. We got a keyboard there. So I go over there, you know, and, um, it's this thing he's the guy's built it and he's got like a place where he built this thing like a room for musicians to play and it doesn't disturb the other other people so we're in this like kind of igloo type of thing that he built more of a square but it's got all the padding the foam and they got a keyboard in there for me and everything i want everything i want's in there you know i said bring you some of your original charts so i bring a few original charts that i had with me and uh you know blah 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 we start playing my music and they're like so, you know, can you join this band? We're going to play in the jazz clubs. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't live here. No, I can't. You know what I mean? So now he's like, well, what if we find you a place? <laughs> <laughs> I said, listen, I'm paying very low rent in Boston. That was one of the reasons, you know, that's a big deal too. When you're a musician, you know, the rent you're paying, you know what I mean? Because, yeah. you know, you see two people, they're living in the same square footage you know what i mean one guy's paying this amount the other guy's paying this amount you know what yeah. i mean yeah and the other guy doesn't care because he's got a job with ibm or something but this guy is a musician he, he needs that little i said listen i got this you know i said well if we can find something in that ring i said yeah, listen i'll tell you what if you can find me a place to live yeah. in that price range yeah i'll come down yeah. here you got me a, you got a band the band's gonna work you're gonna get gigs you're gonna play my original music if you're gonna do all that I'll come. I'll yeah. probably. I said I'm coming down here to explore. Coming right. down anyway, but I, you know, I'm in no position to come down here with no place. So the guy found me a place. Okay. But he found a place in Jersey City. Okay. So, you know what I mean? He tricked me a little bit. Yeah. Jersey City, and not only that, he said it was three fifty because that was where I was playing in Boston. Yeah, yeah. It's three fifty, but it was really seven hundred for two people. Okay. You follow okay. me. Yeah. But I had to find another person. Right. You know what I'm saying? So he didn't, you know, he kind of tricked me, but it got me to New York. Okay. You know, it got me right. to New York. And um, and I started playing in their band and they're playing my original music. And see, with me in the band, they could help draw other people because I could draw some other people into the band. You know what I mean? Right. So, you know, because it's the three of them by themselves, you know, they could just get somebody like me who was in transition finding me, but I, they needed, you know, to get other people involved. You know what I mean? It was going to, it was going to lay on me people that I had played with that were kind of up the food chain, you know, great, you know, to, to jump in, you know what I mean? So, um, so anyway, while that's happening, another guy wants you to play in his band. Okay. And he lives on, and he lives on central park West and he's got to rent, rent controlled apartment that's yeah. an apartment that was outlawed in 1971 they outlawed okay. rent control 1971 so what he has they can hardly ever raise his rent you know right. and he has this big place so he's like wants me to be i said listen i'm i'm here in this place in jersey city but you know you know maybe something comes up whatever anyway he ends up getting married he's got a kid or something like that Something happens and the one they move out, the woman moves out, whatever. Now he's calling me and he's like, I said, he's lowering the price. You know, I said, listen, I'm in here for this amount of money and I'm just, you know, I need, you know, he lowers it all the way to the same amount as I'm in Jersey City. And right. now I'm like, whoa. So you're telling me for the same amount I was in Boston, I could be in Jersey City. Now for the same amount I'm in Jersey City, I can be on Central Park West and 105th Street. So boom, I was like, that's it. So now I'm there. You see what I yeah, mean? Yeah. And so now, you know, now I'm in that place and now starts coming, you know, other things start coming up, you know, see the other thing that was happening at the same time was 
a girl I was dating in Boston. She was transitioning to New York at the same time. Okay. She was, she was, she had been offered a place in Chelsea by someone. So she's in Chelsea. So then I came, you know, and, it, and then we ended up with the same agent and we ended up in Japan. She was in Japan in one venue and I was in that <laughs> other venue in the basement that I told you about. Right. So you see what I mean? Just things started, you know, just happened. Uh, it just, yeah, it just happens the way it happens. I don't even know. And, um, and I, um, yeah, I end up just, uh, you know, going, going to, uh, to New York. And yeah. like I said, I end up doing what I needed to do anyway, which was getting to New York where in those days, anyway, you, it was a landing place. Once you, you know, you got your craft to a certain degree, it's time to go to New York. And I, I had, you know, gotten myself to that degree where it was time to test the waters of New York City. But, but when did you start your, your your vocal career along with the jazz and songwriting? When did that begin? Okay, so the first time I ever did anything vocally was on a TV show um, in upstate New York, Schenectady, uh, where this kid down the street, his mother had a cable TV show. Okay. So she had me on, I think it was public access. And um, I sang Evil Ways. Okay. Okay. Now, around that time, that, that song, you got to change your evil ways, baby. You know that song by Santana? So then I was in a, a, a band, and they needed me to sing a couple of songs, you know, to, they just needed that. You know, they, they, everybody's got to sing a few tunes, you know. So I sing a, a few songs in that band, you know. And then uh, when I went to school, uh, I took vocal lessons uh, it was a okay. vocal class by okay. a guy named Car carlton doctor that's in new england conservatory and okay. now i'm singing things you know Carl, you're done. you know what <laughs> i mean like italian oratorio you know yeah but i'm singing them yeah and um now it really started to get big because because then i'm playing in bands where, where i'm singing and when i got to new york well I also like when I when I play with the Platters and other bands of that nature. They also used to check out my singing for certain parts, you know, and do certain things, certain types of backups to learn certain parts in case the guy's uh, vocal, in case his, his, his um, you know what I mean, in case his his couldn't reach the note because you know he had a cold or something. Someone yeah. had to hit certain notes. So, so yeah. you mean so, to tell me that you sung sometime backup for the Platters? Well. I was prepared to sing okay. a few yeah. notes yeah. if they yeah. weren't ready. And I, it might have happened once or twice where I did that. Yeah. But I could tell you yeah. where it really took place was another band that sang similar music. They were a four-piece. They were in Boston. They were a four-piece um, uh, band, you know, and um, uh, that, that had the four, you know, singers, like stylistics, like the platters, like everybody. You know what I mean? It was like right. maybe a, a woman and, and, and three or four guys. And so they had issues where there was uh, like um, inconsistencies, you know what I mean? Like the, the guy wouldn't show up and, you know, his voice wouldn't be in the proper range and all that. And then they had to say, they had me singing. They would have me singing stuff like, you know, I'm back for more <laughs> of the love that we had before. You know, those songs yeah. from that bubble, bubble, from that era. Yeah. And I was, you know, I'm back for more, and, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. And so I would learn the parts with them. And then I would be there when I, when I didn't hear that, I would jump in with that vocal so that that note was in there when we performed. You see what I mean? So yeah. that was, that other band was, was even more so because I really had to learn a bunch of, and then they were telling me, you should be a singer. They kept saying, these are the singers telling me, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, so now when I really started was I was in uh, a top 40 band when I was living on 105th and Central Park West. I got in a top 40 band at a place called the Palace Stadium. And it's this kind of castle on um, Fort Lee, New Jersey, overlooking, you see the city from there. You know what I mean? Giant windows. And they had a band work six nights a week. And they put me in the band because they needed somebody to sing the pop they right. had a singer, and that singer, he was into Tony Bennett. He was into, you know, Frank Sinatra, all the standards. He, you know, he wanted to sing what he wanted to sing. 
But come Friday, Saturday night, forget it. You know what I mean? The place was packed and they wanted to hear pop songs, the current pop songs of the day. You know what I'm saying? Michael Jackson, Prince, uh, you know, um, you can call me Al, uh, you know, that song by Paul Simon. I don't know. You know, Bruce Springsteen, all those guys. So I kind of became the lead singer on the busiest night. You see what okay. I mean? And he would just sneak in something here because he, he sang 50s stuff good. You know, uh, the 50s, uh, you know, um, the one bubble, the one, one bad boom, tutti fruity, you know, those kind of songs. Yeah, you know what I'm yeah. He had a little thing, but he could not do the rock. Okay. He could not do rock music. He could not. He just he was in his voice, you know. Right. So I had to do all that. Right. So from there, from there came Piano Bar. Okay. Where it's just me, and they don't want to hear a whole lot of instrumental music, if any instrumental music. You know what I mean? So I started to go on tours where I was really there as a singer who accompanied himself you know what okay I'm saying? okay i mean i i showed up there was an audition and i went to the audition and i sang it's a little bit funny this feeling inside you know i sang that <laughs> a song like that one of those kind of songs even if it was could have been that song but i sang it elton john or whatever uh billy joel you know um you know yeah <laughs> I sent them out <laughs> and they sent me out. They, they, they liked it and they sent me out four months, four <laughs> months on a tour of Sweden. Okay. So I was, I was, in, now this is what I was Four months tours. on a tour, tour with who? With who? Well, well, of Sweden, of the country of Sweden. Okay, okay. okay. So yeah, I was, yeah. I was one month in Stockholm. I was one month in a in a city called Östersund. I was one month in a city called Malmo, which is down near Copenhagen, Denmark. I right. could take a little boat from Malmo, and then I was in a one month way up north, uh, and you know, and like 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 where Santa, you know, is from. You know what I mean? It was called Lulio, and yes. I played in a castle of the guy who made a fortune selling hamburgers. In Sweden, he was the first hamburger salesman ever in the country of Sweden, made a fortune selling hamburgers. And then he was in France with all this money and he dove into the shallow end of a pool and became paralyzed. So oh. he was the king. Yeah, he was the king of Lulio. And I played in the, the place the club was called The Castle. And I lived in the castle and I played in the castle. <laughs> wow. So anyway, I would go on these three or four month tours. Now that includes Japan, that includes uh, Norway. I mean, all kinds of places that I would go on these tours as a solo piano singer. And then when I came back, I would come back to a bunch of people who only knew me as a jazz musician. Well, I wasn't a jazz musician, ju I, you know, an instrumental jazz musician, that's all I knew, you know? I was no longer an instrumental jazz musician. I had sang too many songs, you know what I mean? <laughs> I had too many gigs, too many nights, you know what I'm saying? I had crossed over into the other side. So now came the problem for me, because I'll tell you, I was pretty happy to be a sideman, because you know what? You're a sideman. The other guy gets all, uh, takes all the pressure, all the blame. If the gig doesn't go well, they blame the leader. You know, he's got to set up the He's got to do this. He's got to do that. But I had a problem, because for on piano bar, I could not express myself artistically with my instrumentals and with my, you know what I mean? With other musicians, it was just me, you know, but on the other gigs, I could not, I was no longer just an instrumental musician. Do you know what I mean? So I could only pretend for so long. I mean, before the night was over, I would get kind of dark. Like, you know, I felt like I was in a cage. I felt okay. like I was a bird in a cage. You know what I mean? Like open the door, let me fly for a minute here. Yeah. You know? So now I had to be a band leader if I wanted to express myself in the idiom that I was, because I was now in the idiom of a vocalist for sure. I mean, listen, I was on gigs with singers and I already knew I had sang on more gigs than they, than they had in their, <laughs> in their professional life. You know what I mean? Wow. Now, wow. maybe they had more training than me, but I was six nights a week, four sets a night for months as a singer, you know, right. I was playing on gigs where people just, all they said was nice vocal. You know, that was, they didn't, they didn't even, all this piano was down the tubes because they didn't care how well I played. They would just, right. either they liked your voice or they didn't, you know? Right, right. So, and, and uh, so, so I had, you know, so, so now I was in a, a bit of a pickle because I needed to 
I needed to come up with something that would satisfy me as an instrumentalist, as a vocalist, as a composer, you know what I mean? And as a, you know what I'm saying? Uh, a, a, as an arranger even with standards, you know? So that's when I started recording my own albums because I realized, yeah. you know, um, I have outgrown per se, not that I'm not going to keep doing it, I will, but I've outgrown only being a side man. I mean, I've definitely outgrown that, you know, there's right. no way I can, you know, just, you know what I mean? Pretend, pretend I'm not a singer on this gig. Pretend I'm not a <laughs> jazz musician on this gig. Pretend I'm not an instrumentalist on that gig. Pretend I'm not a composer on that gig. You know, right. every side man gig, I'd have to pretend I'm not this or that for the entirety. You right. see what I mean? And, you know, there was a side man gig. Now there were very few. Right. Um, where they would basically utilize all of that. You know, right. there was only really one band that utilized all of that. And that was the band that had, uh, did you ever see the, uh, the late show with David Letterman? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Do you remember, oh, yeah. you remember that big tall bass player that used to jump up and down? He had the blonde hair. He'd jump up and down and play, play the I bass might. on ba David Letterman. You might. All right. So the, yeah. the guy who played the bass on ba David Letterman was also recording uh, well-known recording person. He had played as a sideman on maybe a hundred thousand and a no, thousand records or something. You know, he was a well-known guy. So he was a well-known guy in studio circles. You know, amongst musicians. And then there was a drummer um, who had played with Bob Dylan. He played on Saturday Night Live. He'd done, you know, Bette Midler. All these kinds of people too. He was also in that same. Band, and they were friends. Right. And those guys. Those guys came out to a ski area, in in a Colorado where again I was posing as a piano bar entertainer so I could ski every day because they give me a free <laughs> yeah this they give me it was a free paid vacation you know what I mean they fly me out there they give me a season pass they hope hoping I'd stay the whole season which I, I couldn't out of conscience I wanted to but yeah. you know I, I had to still go back and you know struggle in New York as part of my journey but I wanted to stay it was so much fun and, you know, I, I would ski every day and then I would play, you know, the piano bar music at night. And so, and then I started because they liked me so much, they let me bring other musicians and we would play, you know, a little more jazz and we would mix it up, you know, play with a band. But anyway, those guys saw me there and they were like, wow, let's put together a band when you're done skiing, come back and we'll put together. And to put together the band, it had my, uh, it featured me doing vocals it featured my original composition. And of course, they're such great players that I could, you know, they, of course, they wanted to solo instrument. So that was a gig, you know, there's, but there's not, those don't come, those don't grow on trees. You right, right. Saying? right. That doesn't grow on trees. But, you know, every now and then I'd, I'd have a situation where, like, wow, I can't believe I'm a side man and all I'm getting to do, you know? Hey, you just, but you just said most... something. You usually do. Mm -hmm. You got to, maybe a song, those don't grow on trees. Those don't grow on trees is, is another, it could be a good title, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The band was, the band was called Tofi and the Pussycats. Okay. The okay. And they would, and they would, you know, hook up yeah. these gigs in little bars around New yeah. York City. And it was a blast. But, but the reason I bring them up is because, you know, it's just not going to, you can't expect that you're either going to play and back up the singer or you're going to get to improvise a lot, but you're not going to be able to play your original music. You know, you're either <laughs> going to get to do one, you know, the, the sideman gig is for you to fit into them, not for right. them to fit into you. Right. You're fitting into them, you know, yeah. so you cannot have those kind of expectations. You know what I mean? That right. was just a situation where they were like, we need, we need you to do this. We need, we, we need all that. But for most of them, hey, we just need you, you know, for the platters, you know. Only you. You know what I mean? They don't <laughs> yeah. need anything else. They just need ting, yeah. ting, ting. But that's fine because we're on a right. boat, you know, right. and the boat's going to Jamaica the next day. So that's fantastic. But I'm just saying, uh, for me, musically, I needed to be a band leader. So I started, that's yeah. where my own records came into play. You so you know, became an artist. You became a full-blown artist, singer, composer, uh, band leader, um, in, in instrumentalist, whatever. Right. The full works. You you did it all. I had to. Yep, I absolutely. So you became to. you became Otherwise, you be, you became the developed full-round jazz artist. You're right. 
You're absolutely right. It basically, there was no other choice. I had to jump in that water. There was no, there was no more sitting on the sidelines. You know what I mean? Right. There was no more sitting on the side of the deck of the pool. That was finished. You, you know, jump in the water now, and uh, you know what I mean. Don't let, don't let the door hit you on the back on your way in or whatever. Yeah. You know. Well, tell us about now. Now you, 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 you were taught to sing in Portuguese. Tell us about that experience. Well. Like I said, like I told you before, I come back from Japan and I'm playing in this Brazilian band and I'm playing with these great singers. In fact, nice. it was the singer, one of the singers in that band who called me up and told me to go down. I needed to hear that bass player that ended up, you know, being my connection in, in Brazil, Cesar Machado. But, uh, you know, uh, there were different. See, that band had all different guys. I was one of the only guys that was regular. You know, right. and I wasn't the Brazilian, but they, there were so many Brazilians that could play their music that they could just rotate different people. Like if she's not available, we call her. If she's not available, we call her. So I got to work with these different Brazilian uh, singers. And, you know, sometimes I'd be on a boat with them or I'd be here. We have a break and we're talking, we're hanging out. Yeah. And I would tell them, I would say, look, you know, I, I love that song. You know, I, I love to I love to learn. How to, and they say, you know what, I'll teach you. Which song, Ricky, Ricky, they say, Ricky, which song you want to learn in there? And I'd say, how about this? What do you think of this one? They say, yeah, or this will be good for you, they'd say, you know, Mashkinata or something, some song called Mashkinata. And, um, you know, uh, I, uh, I, I can't remember what he, oh, songs like that so anyway they would teach me it in phonetically you see what i mean they would teach me phonetically how the song went and so it was a great opportunity to learn the song right. um you know what i'm saying without having to learn it like an american i so i, I didn't <coughs> sound like an american person singing it is my point so was, because was it, i was learning it from them was, was, was it hard it mm -hmm, go ahead was it was it was it, was it easy to pick up or was it difficult to, to, to pick up? You know, some people are, are not good at picking up other languages. Yeah, well, what made it easy for me was I was surprised at the way they were teaching me to sing it and what it looked like on the page. I was like, wow, I would have never thought, looking at that word, that it looks like this. That, that right, it really right. sounds like this. You see what I mean? And so I would have sounded like an American person trying to sing Portuguese you see what I mean? Had it not yeah. been for them, because they taught me, you know, the way it's supposed to sound right. on these, and that enabled me to, you know what I mean, to um, to learn it uh, in a way that was probably, a, you know, a lot more authentic than had I tried to do something like that on my own. Okay, so now tell me about songwriting. What, what, tell me about that experience. I mean, you were singing, and then you became a songwriter. Tell me about that. Well, I would always wanted to write songs and I'd always been a composer. Um, but every now and then I would find mm -hmm. myself just in a place where, you know, there was nothing really better to do than write a song. You know, it was like yeah. the best thing to do. I remember one time I was in Japan and um, I walked by this place and it's like a music store. And the guy just tells me he has a room upstairs with a piano. He says, if you, you're playing, you're playing in town. I said, yeah. He says, if you want, just come by right. and we will, uh, we will take you, uh, come by and go up in that room and just, just play. So I'd be up in that room by myself and I'm thinking, well, I can't think of anything better to do up here than write a song. So, I thought, right. you know, it would, it's right. Other times a song would come in my brain and I would write down that little part of it. And then I would compose the rest of it another time. Right. Right. What, what, what is your favorite um, style of writing? Is it jazz or what, what is it your favorite style of writing? Um, I don't know if I really have a favorite. Yeah, I don't think I really have a favorite. I just think um, whatever, what I do is I, I usually allow something to come out. Like usually something comes out and right. Whatever that is, that's the style that I'm going to be writing in. You know, okay. I mean, it could even be a country song. It could come out. It's just something that comes out in a dream 
or it comes out, you know, it just comes to me. And the next thing I know, I'm like, well, I got to take that little molecule and turn it into a, you know what I mean? Uh, and turn it into a pond. Have, have you wrote many, a lot of songs? Many songs? Mm, I've probably written, um, yeah, probably. I mean, it could right. be in the range of, it could be over 50 different types of compositions, whether they're songs or right. they're instrumental pieces or they're vocal pieces or they're just the words or just, just the, uh, you know, or the words and the music. It, I'm sure it's got to be over 50. Mm -hmm. 50 to 100? I don't know. Something like that. Now, tell me about acting, because I remember you mentioned that. Tell, tell me, what, what was your experience in terms of, tell me about the acting. How did that kind of come with the territory, part for the territory? Well, that happened, yeah, that happened because um, basically I had always wanted to act, but right. it was impossible to do too many things. You know, it, right. I, I knew that, I knew that if I wanted to achieve my, or at least I felt if I wanted to achieve my goals in music, I really needed to give that 24 hours a day. But I started to reach a point where I realized, you know, I could chase some other personal goals if I wanted to. And the first one I wanted to chase was ski bum, to okay. be a skier, you know? Okay. <laughs> so, so I went, I went out to Utah mm -hmm. where they have really challenging terrain and tons of snow. And I basically just tried to fulfill my dream of being a ski bum. Okay. Now, after doing that for a couple of years, actually a few years, mm -hmm. um, someone I was, uh, people used to say, what are you doing out here? And I said, well, I'm, trying to achieve my dream of as being a ski bum. I always wanted to be one, and now I am. I said, wow, how long have you been doing it for? And I said, uh, geez, the last five years. And they're like, wow, well, I guess you already are then. And then I was like, you're right. I already achieved it. So, I mean, I already did it. I'm just doing this now because I love it. But right. I can't say I'm still trying to do it. I've had done it, you know? Well, fortunately for me, at the time, I thought extremely unfortunately, I was supposed to go out there and they were going to give me free room, uh, you know, free housing, free food, all kinds of stuff. But I had to kind of keep an eye on somebody who had um, that same disease as Michael J. Fox. You know what I'm talking about? Parkinson's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This guy had Parkinson's. So I felt bad for the family because they wanted me to come up right away. I needed a few weeks, you know, um, I was dating somebody and I didn't want to hurt the person's feelings. I wanted to, you know, break it to her slowly. I wanted to, you know, right. ease out of the things I was doing. I needed a few weeks. I send some guy over there to take care of this guy. And he finds out that this guy like owned a steel company and they got money and all that. So he kind of snakes my gig. He kind of takes over the place. Now they don't need me anymore. It's kind of like, thank you for referring, you know, this guy. <laughs> so now I'm screwed. Right. And I'm stuck. I'm stuck here in New York with nothing because I had planned to be out in Salt Lake City, Utah. So I'm like, what am I going to do? So I'm looking at this paper called Backstage. And have you right. ever heard of a paper called? Yeah. I think I, I have. Yeah. I actually won an award from them in the 1990s when my first CD came out. I was I was what? voted I was voted outstanding singer instrumentalist, and that's only because I had played in so many piano bars right. where they go to the cabarets, and all those backstage people had seen me so many times playing in these piano bars where they have the cabarets and all that kind of stuff because they 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 do reviews of cabaret shows and all that kind of stuff. So they gave me an award at one time. Okay. Anyway, I'm looking in there. Now it's, it's a decade later and I'm looking in there because I got nothing to do. And I see that they're auditioning for an actor for a part. And I'm, I'm now I'm on 43rd Street and 9th Avenue. So I'm, I'm, li I'm living in the theater district now. Right. I'm living in the theater. And I'm like, that audition is like 700 feet away. Wow. Like it's literally three minutes walk. Yeah. <laughs> So I just took the paper. I walked out of my apartment. I walk into the theater and I say, Hey, I see, I hear your blah, blah. I'm here for the audition. And the woman says to me, what part are you here to audition for? And I was like, ah, oh, blah, 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 the part you have, the, the part you have, I can't, 
I don't know what part. I just saw it was, I didn't care. I mean, on whatever part, you know what I mean? You need a train monkey, I'll go, whoo, whoo, well, you know, whatever you need, I'm going to audition for, you know what I mean? So she goes, all right, here, take this, take this paper and take this and, and, and look over the script and tell me when you're ready. Yeah. So she gives me, she gives me the part of what are the star, like this play is called Lab Rats. Okay, lab okay. rats, and and it's about three guys who are these Jerry Lewis type of lab rats. They're goofy, you know what I mean? Yeah, they're yeah. goofy. They they trip all over themselves, and it's hilarious because they're trying to pick up women and they just can't. You know what I mean? They yeah. can't seem to you know fall over their own. They can't even seem to follow their own feet or whatever it is. You know, they're making every mistake in the book trying to pick up women, and so that's what it's about. So I got I'm one of the, she wants me to read one of the lab rats. So I'm like, okay, I, I get the picture. I got to act like a real goofball now. Yeah. So th- you're going to like this story. I'm surprised you asked me this. I am surprised. You're going <laughs> to not believe the story. It's really nuts. So I go up there. I act like a goof, okay? And I read the part, and I, I do the thing, and they like it, and they give me the part. They give me the part as one of the lab rats, right? Right. So now I'm in this play. I'm in this play. And I'm like, okay, I got something to do around here. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm also thinking maybe I should go to a few other of these auditions. <laughs> you know? So I'm, you know, bouncing around to other auditions, but I'm in something already and I'm bouncing around to other things, you know. And um, and again, I'm, you know, I make the mistake of really, I go in, I just see this audition and I'm like, I'm here for the audition. I never, I always screw that up. What role, you know, I don't know what role I just saw audition, you know, any yeah. role. So it has happened again too. And I'll tell you that story, but now I'm, I'm in there and I'm one of the lab rats. So right. we're rehearsing now for this play. We're rehearsing for this play. We're going through our lines. We have to sing these songs. I'm practicing singing them badly. Okay. Right. The other guys can't sing at all. So they naturally sing bad. I have to try to say a couple of times they stopped me and they said, you, you're singing it too good. Yeah. You have to sing it bad. You have to say, it's got to be a little more out of tune. It's got to be a little more, eh, eh, you know what I mean? I'm not some practicing singing about it. All the while they're doing this, there's one part that they have not covered. And I'm seeing them audition people. And this is for the good guy. This, this part is for the guy who gets all the chicks. Right. These lab rats can't get, you know, they can't pick up, you know what I mean? Yeah. They can't pick up, a, you know, an apple, an apple from a tree. They right. can't pick up nothing is my point. I don't have a good analogy, but forget yes, that was it, good. you know. That was good. All right. But this guy, for he can, he can score any chick. He right. can sing. Yeah, he's the man. So now they, he's got to open the show and he's got to sing a jazz standard called The Very Thought of You. Now listen to this. They had taken the very thought of you. They took the melody. I'm the only one who knows this. I'm watching them audition these people. They put new words to it. They just right. changed, put words to it that relate to the play. And just, but the same thing as the very thought of me with different words. And I am watching these guys come in and they don't know how hard it's going to be to fill that role, in my opinion. You know why? Because actors take singing, they take voice lessons. And they know how to sing big cabaret, you know, mame, you know, who took the girl out of the corn, mame. They know yeah. how to sing like that. They yeah. don't know how to sing like a Nat King Cole, you know what I mean? Right. They right. don't know how that, that kind of singing, that style, they haven't studied it ever, ever, right. you know. They only know how to sing cabaret. And then not only that, most of them don't sing at all, they're actors. Right, so right. you got two problems. You got an actor singing it. You got an actor who just can't sing anyway. Forget it. He's not going to open the show. Then you got another actor who can sing, but he's not with that style. Not going to fit what they're looking for for the part. And I'm like, they're never going to fit. They're never going to find it. And what should I do? What should I do? And I'm like, I'm not telling them. I am not telling them that I can do that. Right. I'm not going to tell them because right. I came in as an actor. I got the role fair and square as an actor, and I'm one of the lab rats as an actor, and I have a challenging role being something I'm not. You know what right. I mean? This isn't going to be hard for me. If I, you know, I can, this is, that's who I am. You know? I mean, as far as being able to execute the song anyway, because they really need the song. He sang like three songs, the guy sang three songs. But the other two songs, I'm not saying, I'm saying the opening song, 
is what you're going to have trouble because it opens the show. Right. The first thing that happens, the lights go up, and here comes Mr. Cool. Right. And he walks all the cool, walks all around the, the theater. He right. walks the theater, you know. Right. So he's got to charm everybody. He's got. Right. This is a lot to ask of just your average Joe actor. Right. And I'm thinking they're not gonna, they're not gonna. I don't know how they're gonna find somebody. A, but I'm not telling them because I, I got a gig here. I'm not gonna <laughs> do that. I'm on my way now. We're getting close to the to the to the uh, performance. Right. And I'm shocked at how close they are getting to the performance at this part, and they still haven't filled it. Because the guy has a few speaking lines, but not a big deal. It's the, the it's the song in the beginning that's the you know you know what I mean. The other songs you know are are not as big a deal. You know you still got to do them, but it's perfect for me, but not challenging. You know what I mean? Right, it's right, not right. as challenging as being a lab rat. I'm on my way to a jazz for peace concert, and I'm in the car, and the phone rings, and I see it's the producer of that show, <laughs> and I answer it, and that producer says. Uh, Rick, uh, you never told us you were a famous jazz singer and you're in this, but it's not a little, you know what I mean? And I'm like, well, I didn't think you, you know what I mean? What do you, I, why do I need to tell you? Like, why do I need to tell you all that? Yeah. Anyway, you know, they, they were very nice. They were understand. No, they perfectly understood. Believe me, they perfectly understood, you know, I was yeah. like, why, cause why, why would I jump out of that role for the other, you know? Because it's a little, bit, a little bit of a downgrade because the lab rats are the three stars, per se. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So she says, listen, could you just go to the audition tomorrow? Because it's the last audition that they're going to have for this part. And they got to pick somebody. And could I just go there? All right? Yeah. So there were four four people auditioning. And I could see there were four. None of them are going to, you know what I mean? And we'll then they it. said, Rick. Yeah, they're not gonna be so they gave me the thing and I you know I sang the song and she's like, Could you please? And they said, you know what they said basically it doesn't pay a lot anyway. She said, No, 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 we'll pay you the same as the lab rat. You just, you know, we, we gotta have you, you know. I couldn't believe it being needed, you know. I felt yeah, it was, it was an honor really to yes. be needed. I'm not yeah. even a professional, you know, I just I'm just like getting my feet wet here. Not that yeah. I haven't acted before, but I'm just saying, you know, these actors have gone to thousands of auditions and they really need me. So I came in, I did it. I switched my role. They got another, they, they got another lab rat and I became that guy. Well, after that, after that play happened, she calls me up and she says, you know, Rick, I just want you to know you can do our such versatile. You can do something. Mean, I can't believe you could be a, a goofy lab rat and then you could be <laughs> Mr. I can't. Oh, 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 oh. And all these compliments, right? I mean, everything you'd want to hear from like a booking agent. And I'm thinking to myself, that's great, but you're just a producer and why already did the gig? And how, how is that? That and $4 is still going to get me the same cup of coffee, you know? Right, right, right. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I was happy to jump in, happy to be. Uh, I thought, what can I say? Well, I keep doing these acting things now. And I'll tell you, I was in some crazy ones. I was in one. I walked into one. And again, I'm like, I'm here for the part. What part? Uh, she says, the only one we got open. This is what this woman says. This is in a comedy club. They were doing a play in a comedy club. She says, the only role we have available is a transvestite prostitute. <laughs> oh, oh, man. And I'm like, what could I do? I came all the way out here. You yeah, know what I mean? Let's give, see me what's... The, give me the thing. Already. I gave it. They loved it. Yeah. You know, because, you know, they <laughs> liked it because I was funny. I was right, funny. Right, me right, doing right. it is funny. See, if it's a real transvestite, it's not going to be as funny. You see what right. I'm saying? A real right. transvestite is going to be too, you know what I mean? But me trying to be a transvestite was a riot. So they <laughs> loved me in the role. So now yeah. I'm in that play too, right? But, I mean, I'm like, I want to get out of this dress, you know? Yeah. At some point after doing a few of those shows, the woman says, okay, listen, Rick, um, learn another role. Learn <laughs> another role that's in the play. You know what I mean? She says it. I'm like, really? Okay. So there was a role of a mafia guy. Okay. A mafia guy. And this is so funny. It's a black guy that was doing the role, but <laughs> he was he was acting like Mar he was imitating Marlon Brando. So to right. see a black guy imitating Marlon Brando is hilarious. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I can hilarious. imagine. I can imagine. I can imagine. And his name was Rick and he was a good actor. He's a yeah, yeah, good actor. Yeah. I can tell you yeah. So I was 
I was psyched to be his understudy, right? Right. So I'm his understudy in that role. That's fine. Right. Now they're coaching me in that role. I'm learning that role and I'm still doing this drag queen role. Well, sure enough, Rick gets sick and he can't do the role. And even she was afraid. She's like, I would take the role. I said, no, whoa, 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 whoa. You know what I mean? I'm you got I, I I'm the understudy. You gotta go, you know what I mean? And she finally agrees. And so I was in a play where I played in the same play a transvestite drag queen drug addict and a head of the mafia. <laughs> wow. In the same, I, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I was getting these diverse, amazing opportunities as an actor. Right. Now I go the next year I go skiing because I didn't have any housing problem. Everything worked right. out. I go to the ski. And now while I'm there, because I'm, I say, could you also meet new friends? You know, right. I love actors. I really do. Some of them are just wonderful people. Some of them are really fun. They're cool. And I, I had met a number of these guys, and some of them were calling me. Said, "Hey, you know, you need to call such and such when you get back. She's been asking about you." And I'm like, "Asking about me for what? Does she want to put the play back on the same play?" She I said, "I said, you know, if that woman was a booking agent, that would be a dream come true because she's compliment." And the, one of the guys says, well, you know, I think she's into that. I think she's involved in management. I said, what? <laughs> said, yeah, you know what? Give her a call when you get back. So I give her a call. And she says, Rick, I was looking at you. I said, yeah, I'm sorry. I was blah, blah, blah. But one of the guys told me, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I said, what's going on? She says, well, I kind of need you on my roster. <laughs> so she's got a roster. So now I got an agent, you know? Right. And she's sending me on these various things, you know, and they're, they're, you know, a lot of them are extra roles, the extra, you know, but you go yeah. out there, you know, you, but it's cool because you're with other, other actors, you know what right. I mean? And you're, right. you're, you're mingling with all these different stuff and you're seeing how they make the movies and you're seeing how they do stuff is behind the scenes. It's a great learning for me in my position. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, right. you know, if, if once, if you, you know, once you're, if you're a star role and as you wouldn't want to do that, but for me, I'm, I'm learning a lot, you know, she said, and they're all wild kinds of things. And I'm and I'm building up a resume right. as an actor, as an actor. So one day she, um, she calls me for this thing. Now this right. is for most of her, by the way, most of her roster is, um, is black. Right. Right. Black. Most of her, most of her, most people in that play were black, you know? Right. 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 Uh, so I know, I'm, I'm just saying, I don't know, if, I'm, I'm just guessing, okay? But right, I'm right. guessing that now and then she needs a Hispanic person. Or she needs somebody to be Caucasian, you know Right, I mean? right, right, right. Because she's sending me on stuff right. that like, you know, like like one time she sent me on something to go down to, uh, um, it's the um, KISS 108 FM or something. It's the one that plays classic rock. The radio yeah. station in New York City plays classic rock. And she calls me up. Can you speak like a Puerto Rican person? Okay. And okay. I said, well, I play, I play basketball with, you know, Puerto Ricans. And I play back, like a Cuban, you know, she, she wants right. to speak like Spanish, a Spanish person trying to speak American. I said, I play basketball with Spanish people a lot. So I can yeah. speak like they do when they play basketball, you know. Right. Said, okay. Well, I'll tell you what, go down to such as a, I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. So I don't look like that. You know what I right, mean? Right. And I don't want them to, you know, I said, I'll tell you what, listen. Give me, oh no, I said, I can make a tape for you. And if you like the tape, yeah. then, you know what I mean? So I send her the tape and then they tell me, she said, I said, you got to play it for the guy. Cause when I right. walk in there, he's going to know I'm not who I'm speak speaking like. So right. She plays it for the guy. She sends a little tape recorder, like the little tape message through email. She sends it to the guy at the radio station. Right. And I ended up going down there and like, I did like five commercials for a car dealership. Okay. That's trying to attract um, business, Latino business. Yeah. But I was the guy speaking. Yeah. See what I mean? I was the voiceover. Yeah. Right. You know, okay. Things like that. You never know. I was yeah. in a, I was in a commercial for um, a, um, uh, a a law agency. Okay. And I played I played a you know you used to watch TV and you thought that that guy was injured. No. That's an actor telling a story about a guy who was injured. You know? injured. Okay. I played, I played a truck driver. Right. And I was talking about my accident. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's yeah. what I'm saying. There was a variety of things. Yeah. Right. And so that's the deal. So um, so one day I got a call from her to go do something 
at this uh, not far from right right here in Midtown, and it was it was the um, it's Sundance, but it's the black version of Sundance. The, uh, you know what I mean? Okay. The black Sundance. Okay. Okay. It's called. Um, I could. T- it's on here. Hold on one second. It's called. Um, mm-hmm. Oh dear. Ah, oh, Urban World. Urban Urban World. Okay, Urban, Urban World. Urban World. Urban, Urban World. World. It's a big it's a big deal. It's a big deal. I didn't know much about yeah. it, but it's a big deal. Yeah. And she's telling me, you know, you got to realize people really want to be in these things. It's like the actors are, you know, very into, but I she said I I, I need you for, for a couple of parts. Yeah. Well, it was a it's a story about a racist situation in a okay. racist town. Right. And they needed she need, there were two small parts and she needed to be the, I was playing a racist judge. And okay. I was playing I was playing some other white person too. You right, know right, I mean? right. She needed me to do both of that. I was the that, you know the two I was the I was playing the white part. You know what I mean? Yeah, right, right, right. So yeah, so I get over there and um the guy playing opposite me is on to kill a mockingbird on Broadway, the lead. Oh, okay. He's a guy playing with that other guy, Jeff, Jeff something, you know, who's a big star. Jeff, you know, he was in Dumb and Dumber with Jim Carrey, that other guy. Okay, so these things. guys. Yeah. yeah, that big star and this other big star are the stars of To Kill a Mockingbird on Broadway. So that guy was in the, you know. And so anyway, for that, she said, hey, you need to, you got to bring your resume because we give up, we put the resumes on tables and everyone has to bring the resume. And I started Right and down. I had to make the resume that time because I, I might have had a little resume, but it was old and dated. I had to write down, and I was like, "Whoa!" I you had a lot, lot of roles. Of, I had a lot of stuff. I had a lot yeah. of stuff. I had a. I had a. It looked like the other actors' resumes. You know what wow. I'm saying? It wow. was like boom, 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 boom. Yeah, the other actors was like boom, boom. You know, all these little things, and so did mine. So yeah. did mine. So I got you know that's kind of that's what happened with acting. And so, like I said, I uh, I have an agent and. I'm so happy and lucky and fortunate to have her and she's such a nice person. And so yeah. I just, you know what, when she calls, I do it, whatever she calls, yeah. call me for something. You want me to be a, you know, you want me to be a rooster. I will crow. You know what <laughs> right, I mean? right. Right. Well, you, 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 I, can. You, I mean, she has faith in me. So I just right. want to come true for her every time. You, you're the, you're the quint, quintessential artist, well-rounded artist. So let's give, I guess we will get, let's go here to, how the jazz thing, becoming the artist and all of that. And then just share with us the, as you did before, the in, the places that you really enjoy performing, just not even just jazz for peace, but maybe can be jazz for peace, different countries. Tell us how, how at all, at some point you, you, you became the, the, um, the, the jazz um, sensation and we're renowned and then tell us about the different i guess a few of the countries that you want to share that you probably didn't share last time just for the audience well i'll tell you the first country that i ever really went to i mean maybe i had been to a country i you know the first country of really really like shocked me like wow this is really far away that i'm my music is taking me um, I was playing in Boston. I was a student and I was playing at a place called the Half Shell, which is a beautiful band shell. And it was kind of a cool gig. I was I was playing my own music and um, there was an issue with, I needed a drummer and I was dating an Icelandic girl. Right. And I said, listen, I'm kind of stuck. I got this thing coming up and the, the, the drummer can't make it or whatever. I need a drummer. And she contacted her Icelandic friend who's a drummer. So this Icelandic drummer plays with me on this gig, plays my original music, et cetera. And on the break, he's like, wow, so much fun playing with you. He says, uh, hey, have you ever been to Iceland? And I said, no. He's like, oh, would you like to go sometime? I said, sure, sure. Yeah. Sure, I'd like to go, you know. I mean, I'm thinking this is, you know, what are you talking about? You know what I mean? <laughs> Iceland, like, that's like, I can't even fathom that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but he was dead. Well, I didn't know. I just like, I was like, okay. He just let me know. Yeah, he kept. He was kind of serious. Well, you know, I'll check into it. I'll let, I'm like, you let me know. You know, I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll hold my breath. I'll hold my breath, and you just let me know. You know, I didn't, yeah. I didn't think yeah. anything of it. But right. my girlfriend spoke Iceland. You know, Iceland spoke. I said the two of them. I don't know if it was the two of them or it was him. But somehow he hooks up this tour of Iceland, and I end up in Iceland. And so you know that was 
one of the first times when I realized, you know, my music, who the hell knows where my music is going to take me? Because, you know, I, I'm, I'm in Reykjavik now. Who, have, who knows what's next, you know? Right. So um, my favorite place is the place where I have the best opportunity to, you know, to do my thing. That's right. kind of how right. I feel. Because um, I've been to some amazing places, you know, and I wouldn't have enjoyed them as much as I would have enjoyed, you know, being in some not so amazing place. Having everything come together artistically and musically. You know what I mean? So that factors into the place. You know, it's not, in other words, I can't compare the place without comparing the musical situation that it, it encompassed, you know? To jazz for peace. Well, or myself. I mean, okay, for example, okay, let's take La Paz, La, La Paz, Bolivia, right? Okay. Um, I ended up in La Paz, Bolivia at a place called Club Thelonious, and I played there mm -hmm. for a week, and they had all, all Bolivian musicians playing with me and playing my music. Um, now, I love Bolivia. I love traveling to Bolivia. They took me to this place. It's the highest mountain in the world, Lake, Tiki, Lake Titicaca, something like that, the highest elevation lake. And I got to, you know, see uh, all these people and the border of Peru and all these, you know, the, uh, the, the amazing, the elevation of, of La Paz itself and all that stuff. But I had a really cool band that knew my music. And so went with the combination of the two made La Paz a wonderful situation. Whereas had I been, let's say, um, you know, not able to do my thing, you know, um, it wouldn't have been anywhere near as great. You see what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. I, I have to factor them both in. I can't just factor one. I can't right. just factor, you know, if I would, if I would factor one, I'd choose the music first. Okay. You know? okay. But, but I can't factor in the location without factoring in, was it a good musical setting for me? Right. But what was one of your, your exciting places in Europe? I mean, like, like in Western Europe or something. Mm -hmm. Like maybe Germany, um, England, or yeah. right. So yeah, Germany. I played. Um, I did a radio. It, it was broadcast on the radio all over the country, and I think the mm. concert was in Dusseldorf. Okay. And that was really that was really fun because I got to take bring a drummer with me, um, who's a legendary drummer. His name is Idris Muhammad, and he's a legendary drummer. He had played with all these different people. And um, he had played with Sam Cooke at one time. Okay. And um, yeah, and he was from New Orleans. And he told me to call this guy in New Orleans if I wanted to. He wanted me to play in New Orleans so I could see what that was all about. And he gave me the number of a, of a club owner in New Orleans. And when I told that club owner, I, it was from, you know, he had recommended me. He was like, whoa, let me get my date book out, you know. So, um but uh, I was able to go with him. And then another a bass player named Wayne Dockery, who I knew but was living in Paris, was able to come from Paris to Dusseldorf. And so we all converged and we did a concert there and it was a lot of fun. So that would be Germany. That's one of the most memorable events in Germany. Um, what, other country, what, other, what other countries did you mention? Did you say, did you say Eastern, like Bulgaria? Um, I know that that's that sounds interesting. They all Tell us have about stories. That. Uh, I one time I I um I had this festival in Bulgaria that basically wanted to have all these big name artists and me, and they wanted to bring me out to Bulgaria and have me play with Bulgarian musicians. So the I sent all my music through the internet to all the Bulgarian. They learned all my music through the internet, and um. I flew to Bulgaria and I had hurt my leg playing basketball just before I left. I was kind of limping. And they, when they saw me kind of limping, or maybe they had it all set up anyway, they had this very attractive woman. They said, this is your bodyguard. She's going to, wherever you go, she's going to go with you. I was like, oh man, all right. Um, <laughs> so that was kind of fun because there's this beautiful woman who's my bodyguard, supposedly. So she took me to all the restaurants and all the places and all that. And then um, 
uh, I limped onto the stage and it was a giant hall with like 8,000 people. And they told me to bring CDs. I brought a box of CDs and uh, they came backstage and we got good news and bad news. I says, what? They said, uh, well, your CDs, uh, they're all gone. They sold, but all sold out in like five minutes. Do you have any more CDs? I was like, oh my God, I don't have any, maybe one or two, you know, that was it. So I obviously I didn't, bring, but I, you don't know what it is when you go there. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, it was fun. I played there and then they had another gig in some other club that was also packed. Uh, and then I played there and some musicians from another band, Charlie Hunter, that were playing with him that I knew the guys, they came and sat in with me and we made a kind of party out of it, stuff like that. So all these little like countries, they all have different stories. They're all unique mm -hmm. and they're all very unique and different stories, you know? Definitely, definitely. So I guess we coming to the end. Um, tell us... Um, what would you say to to aspiring, I guess, kids that are like in middle school, high school, college, that would be interest, interested in becoming a, a professional musician, maybe a singer musician, or even a jazz musician? What, what, what do you have to say to the young people? I would tell them that, um, you know, Following your star can be very rewarding uh, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, even though it can be hard on so many other levels. I would suggest, I would suggest that you do follow your star because a lot of people who get rich and they follow another path and they make a lot of money, um, they don't seem to be that happy. And you know what's weird? they seem to be the most happy when you're sad. You know what I'm saying? It's like they're, you know, they have, it's almost like they're carrying around some, you know what I mean? Something's not right with that, with the picture, you know? Um, so I'd rather see someone follow their star, but I would suggest um, that you study like certain things. Like I would suggest a philosophy called stoicism. Okay. You ever heard of that? Uh, educate me on that. Okay, so there was this Roman Empire emperor. His name was Marcus Aurelius. And he ruled Rome for 32 years. Okay. And he, he wrote a journal that he never expected to be published, and he called it Meditation. And in it, he wrote what is now considered to be Stoic philosophy. Okay. And there's a handful of these other guys, another guy named Epictetus, uh, you know, there's, there's these other handful of guys that also contributed to it, but they're just, um, they help you to put things into perspective. And believe me, it's challenging. You know, it's challenging. You'll need all the help you can get. Um, every day I try to make sure I'm not, you know what I mean? Like um, taking things for granted or, you know, um, getting overly emotional about something that I have no control of, things like that. And the study of Stoicism, and like I said, you could start there with Marcus Aurelius because this book he wrote called Meditations is just almost a Bible for that philosophy. And then you can see videos on it. You know, you go YouTube, there's tons of videos on that. And it's a great thing to study that kind of thing. And I think also you need to study other people that you look up to, other artists, because you're going to see that a lot of the people that I looked up to, I've already outlived. A lot of them died at age 34. I don't know why. But if you look at someone like Charlie Parker, you know, he died when he was 34. And there's, you know, there's a handful of these guys. You know, Ma Martin Luther King, I love, I love what, you know, the, the, the stuff he did. You know, John Coltrane was dead at, I believe, 39, you know. Um, you'll see that, you know, don't expect it to be easy because it wasn't easy for them. These people achieved a lot. And you have to ask yourself every day, would I rather have taken the easy way and sacrificed the achievement or would I rather, and you know, you, I, you always end up saying, no, I wouldn't. So if you wouldn't, what are you complaining about? You just need to put things into perspective. Uh, you know, you, sometimes you have to make a lemon out of, uh, you have to make lemonade out of a lemon, things like that, they say, you know. Um, but I mean, I, I would say, try to prepare yourself mentally, emotionally, philosophically, and spiritually 
to follow your star in life is that all possible because if you do the world is going to be a better place for it that your achievements are going to be so welcomed by this we need you we need it so bad you know our world needs it so that that would be my suggestion and try to learn from other people you know uh the great art tatum once said there was never a pianist that he couldn't learn from and when i read that i realized wow here's a guy who i thought was maybe the greatest person to ever play the piano at the time i learned about him when i was in high school uh what could he possibly gain from anybody else who played the piano and yet he says he never met a piano player he couldn't learn something from so that showed me, you know, the perspective of, you know, constantly um, see if you can place yourself with people that you can learn from, you know, constantly be open to the possibility of, of learning things, uh, crit, you know, be, self, be able to criticize yourself um, and be able to accept criticism, but not let that criticism overrun, override you. You know what I mean? Because some criticism... Uh, you have to say to yourself, you know what, at the end of the day, uh, that's not what I want to do, even though that person made that, I'm, that's not, you know, and other criticisms, you're going to say, you know what, that person, I can learn from that critique. So you've got to, you, know, you have to navigate it, not let it get the best of you. Great, great. So just a few little things here. Um, but who were your influences in terms of, of jazz? And we got maybe one or two more questions and that's it. But who were your, the major influences that inspired you as, as a artist, I guess from the vocal? I mean, it can go from mm -hmm. writing music to arranging to, right. to playing music to singing. Who were your right. influences? So let's start with singing. You know, uh, mm -hmm. for me, I liked people what what really impressed what really um what really kind of reached me what as a singer was mm -hmm. one time uh i was in japan and mm -hmm. i was singing and i was on stage with a guy named toki who who recently passed away he was he's a great saxophone player but he was also a great person he was a great spirit he's just this wonderful guy and he told me he said you know rick when i sing with when you sing with 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 the band he mm -hmm. said it's Feel, he, he said, I don't feel like I'm playing behind a singer. I feel like I'm playing with a singer and that your voice is one of the instruments in the band. And that's what I want. That's what I right. aspire to do. You see what I mean? And now some people don't get that. And a lot of average, your average Joe, they don't get that because they only know the America's Got Talent, whatever it is, you know, those famous shows where you hear the singer sing almost with, a, as a, with, the, with the music in the background, you know what I mean? Right, that's all right. we know, the judge is singer, but, but that's not the kind of singer I want to be, you know what I mean? Right. I want to be, that, and, if, and if they don't get it, then they don't get it. But, right. you know, I want to try to be the singer that's really just one of the other instruments in the band, not, you know, the singer of it doesn't matter who's in the band, you could just play a recording, it doesn't matter. That, to me, is not the kind of singer I want to be. But now the singers I enjoyed... They're not all jazz at all. You know what I mean? Okay, like, yeah. I mean, I love, I love Ray Charles, you know, who I yeah. gotta love Ray Charles. I mean, oh my God, what a singer, but Ray Charles really is coming from R and B. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Blues is where he's coming from. And even though I don't, you know, I, you don't have to even want to sing like him. You just got to enjoy him, you know, for what he right. wants. But I mean, there's so many of those guys. I mean, you know, I like Greg Allman. I love, love some of his vocals, you know, with the Allman brothers, they were a Southern rock band, you know, um, Sure, I like Sinatra and I liked all those guys. I mean, there's a lot of, there's so many singers I like, but I'll tell you, I would never in a million years discriminate and say, I don't like you because you're not singing jazz. That's a way off, you know what I mean? I actually like you because I like you. And if you're singing jazz too, that's kind of cool. I mean, I like Chet Baker, you know? But, um, and, and a lot of people said I sounded like Chet Baker early on. In fact, I was in, I was in, um, uh tokyo on fm tokyo once and we were on a break and the guy's looking at a chet baker record and looking at my record and he goes okay on the, on the next break i want you to put chet baker let's get lost which is a song of his that he sings rick delorado let's get lost and while it's it's playing he'd go oh this one chet baker and he was playing mine 
So he wow. couldn't tell the difference between right. me and Chad Baker on that song, which right. is from my first CD. And I'll tell you, if you listen to it, it's kind of crazy. And yeah. and I didn't really listen to Chet sing it before I sang it. You know, I just, that's the way I felt like interpreting it. But it does sound like Chad Baker. But anyway, um, no, I mean, uh, you know, I, I love, there's so many singers that I love and I could, you know, I could care less what, uh, what style of music it is if, mm. if, you know, if I like them, you know what I mean? I just, I just like, I just, it really transcends any kind of style of music. Uh, you know, a lot of them are pop singers and a lot of them are rock, sing, you know, rock or pop or soul or rhythm and blue. A lot of the singers I like are coming from other styles besides jazz, no doubt about it. And I'm not shy about it. And, you know, sometimes critics write that, you know, he say he sounds like Michael Franks. They'll say, you know, well, that's probably because I like I like the way Michael Franks sings. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I have nothing against. It. If you want to say that, if that's a problem for you, then eh, so be it. I mean, I'm I uh, that's you know I I like the way Michael Franks sings a few a few tunes. There's no doubt about it. So I do like him. You know, um, but when you get to other people. You know, when I grew up with jazz, I mean, there were these, I like these piano players that kind of had their own style who you could identify with them right away. You know, I love a lot of the young kids because they sound like so many different people. And I admire that. I think that's fine. I understand the work that goes into it. But for me, I love the fact that I'd hear a couple notes and instantly know it was McCoy Tyner. That was so cool. Or Keith Jarrett or Herbie Hancock, or Chick Corea, you know what I mean? There were these piano players that they were identifiable, and I loved these guys that had their own style. So that's really where I was coming from uh, in jazz instrumental period, you know, train, you know, there's only one cold train, you know, the, the park, you know, a lot of these guys, they had their own identifiable sound. And so I, I really, you know, I have, my heart is a little bit more towards those kind of guys who have their own thing there, who have their own style, have their own drop in the water, you know, um, when it comes to composing, now it's all over the map. You know, it depends. Yes. I mean, uh, I like Debussy a lot. I like a lot of Debussy's works, you know. Um, but uh, I like, uh, you know, I love Steely Dan, you know. So, I mean, there's so many different guys that I like. If you mentioned them, I could say it. But it's, it's, a, it's a vast, it's a wide variety, you know. Now, what about your, 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 your in acting? Who do you like since now that you're an actor? Well, people think I look like Robert De Niro. Okay. I don't know. I can know, see that a little I, bit. I can see I that a get, little bit. I got stopped on the street a few times. Now I saw one one people, some people stop me because they're like tourists around here. And I'm walking from one place to another and I just, you know, they're either tourists. Hey, can we take a picture of you? You're you hey Robert De Niro. And you know, one time I told the people, I said, Listen, I'm I you know, I'm not Robert De Niro. I mean, I'm really sorry to have to do this. They said, you know, they said, Can we take a picture up with you anyway? I'm like, <laughs> oh, they took a picture with me anyway, you know what I mean? <laughs> I said, you, they said, well, you look like it. So, so then I told them who I was and they Googled me and they're like, whoa, I'm glad we got that picture. You know, <laughs> you are somebody. Yeah. So who do I like acting? Um, Boy, there's a lot of people. Oh boy. Um, Could you give me some names maybe and I could tell you or something? But for actors? Yeah, because uh, I don't um, know where to what's, start. What, I don't know where to start. What's the guy that um that did Tennessee Williams movie and was the I mean one of the um what, what, the, the the big guy the yeah, I mean um well I mean yeah they did Tennessee Williams movie I'm trying to I'm trying to think um. Uh, it, it's, he, he, he played in, in some of the mafia movies as well. Oh, I would like to know. Um, was it Ray Liotta or one of those kinds? He of played guys? One, in um, one of them, and he was like the, the, the grandfather, and he died in the chair. Well, but you know, like he just he did uh, of his own causes. Um, um, yeah, because I mean, I'll tell you, with me, often it's like the movie I like. I like the right, movie, right, right. and then a certain character in that movie I'll like, you know. And some some yeah. actors I like them, I'll love them in that movie, but I might not like them in every single movie. Marlon Brando, Marlon Brando. Well, okay, Marlon Brando. Yeah, I we brought him up earlier. I told you that guy was was doing. He was a black guy, but he was doing a Marlon Brando yeah, imitation, yeah. and that's what made it so funny. Yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah. 
But uh, yeah, I mean, Marlon Brando was one heck of an actor, and especially, especially in that movie, I Cover the Waterfront. Is that the, is yeah, the yes, cover yeah, the that was a great movie. Yes. I mean, he just he Brando's just unbelievable in that yeah. movie. I mean, just unbelievable, you know. But I mean, Apocalypse Now was also a great movie. I thought, you know, even yeah. though Brando had a cameo role, uh, but there was so much other great acting and just just it was just such a great movie all around, you know. Um, there's um, I've been told I need to watch a movie called The Red Line. Red okay. Line. Okay, it's it's uh, I I'm I'm hesitant to watch more war movies because they're kind of depressing. But it, it's a movie apparently um, that Tom Hanks came out with a movie right around the same time, and it got buried in the in the famous Tom Hanks movie, you know. Right. And so a lot of people didn't really realize how good it was. And now I'm told it's a really great movie that I need to watch. But um, um, boy oh boy, I mean I used to tell people I loved a movie called Buffalo '66. Okay. I've ever heard of that movie? But it's okay. a killer. It's a great, great movie. Buffalo 66. And it's this guy who kind of directed it and put the whole thing on himself and did all did everything. And it's got these really cool actors in it who were, you know, not A-list at the time. You know what I mean? Right. Like Mickey Rourke, who was banned from everything. Right. And nobody would hire him. He's in that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And there's a bunch of, like, there's like six or seven guys in Jelsea Houston does a great role in it. It's called Buffalo 66, and, and the actors just are incredible, and the story is just incredible. And, you know, the whole thing just is uh, really great, really great. It's, uh, you know, just something as far as something that you might not have heard of. Uh, but, you know, I love those other movies like Casino and, you know, uh, you know those kinds of movies. Um, yeah, I mean, probably, probably at like 11 o'clock tonight, some special actor who I love universally will come into my head and I'll be kicking myself for not saying who it is right now. You know what I mean? But the ca yeah. as far as an individual actor, you know, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, listen, um, Joey Pesci is, you know, a bit of a nutcase, but he's good in every movie. I mean, he, you know, I like him in every movie I've seen him in just about, you know what I mean? Yeah. Now I might not have seen, all of his, I might not have seen all of his movies, but you right. know, the the four or five that I've seen that are kind of classic movies that he's in, he's you know he's damn good. Yeah, he's a riot, and he cracks it riot. up. You know, Casino, he's amazing. Yeah, it's it's great movies. Mm -hmm. So, so let's go to 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 your to your your brainchild, your your baby, your your baby, um, Jazz for Peace, and I, I have to tell people, go back and watch. Um, part two, where, where the whole interview was dedicated to Jazz for Peace, and you'll learn some interesting stories and and the beginning of it. But I guess at this moment, just tell us um, what's going on with Jazz for Jazz for Peace, and I guess for, I mean, if you can be extremely short, just give them a nutshell of how it begun, and then just tell us what 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 um what are the future what what just a, just a brief briefly about jazz for peace and what and, and tell us what the future holds for jazz for peace okay so if i was going to tell you something you know short and sweet about jazz for peace it is um the re you know we used to always say people now know that it's really true but they used to say they used to always say it sounds too good to be true how could you possibly blah 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 but it we have a model and this model works, okay? So here's the way it works. Here's how Jazz Your Peace can help any organization, no matter how big, no matter how small, no matter how old, no matter how new, no matter how popular, no matter how uh, enriched they already are. You know what I mean? We're, we're not just able to only help, you know, someone who is already really doing well. And the reason being is because we start with a comment and someone will look at Jazz for Peace uh, videos or, you know, just go to our website and just watch a few things, go on YouTube, you know, read some information. Uh, we actually have a, a page where you can go jazzforpeace.org forward slash knowthefunder.pdf. You could just type that into your browser window, however you want to do it. You, someone sees something on Jazz for Peace and they, they send us an email at info at jazzforpeace.org. And usually it just says something like, hey, 
you know, I've been watching those, some of the stuff you're doing, and I really think it's great. It's so wonderful. And, wow, it, uh, you know, it could really make a big difference for our, my outstanding cause, which is help does this or does that. Simple comment like that. That's like those spinning little seedlings that you see on a tree, okay? It spins around, it spins around, it falls down. Probably hundreds of thousands of them fall and only thousands of them become trees, right? Then it's a seedling. It doesn't have to be a tree. It can just end up being a seedling, a comment. So, but it starts with a comment. Now, if we want to, we can make that comment into funds for you. And here's how we do it. We say, okay, great. I'll tell you what. Here's a document with your with your little comment in there, basically explaining to people that you've checked out Jazz for Peace, you like what you see, and you want them to do the same thing by clicking on this link, reviewing the information, and making their comment, okay? So now that gets your board members or your band members, if you're an artist, your fans or your, you know, if you're, uh, could be your fa friends, family, supporters, handful of people you send that out to, okay? It's a little, we created for you. You send it to them and they reply back to you. Now you might have to, you know, follow up with them, check with them in person. Hey, did you get that? Cool. Can you take a minute, check it out, give me your comment. That, th their comments come in, those are the roots. So now a seedling has grown into roots, okay? Now you've got some core roots, okay? What you need are the full set of roots. So some of those people, which sometimes it's your board members if you're an outstanding cause, they will now do the same thing you did. They'll take the same letter and each one of them will send it out to their friends, family, and associates. People that they want to be future fans of their band or future uh, donors of their outstanding cause, you know? So we grow that into the full set of roots of a tree. Just imagine a tree under the ground, all those big roots, those long roots, those short, those little teeny tiny roots, those are the roots of your tree. Now, who are those people? Those people are actually going to get paid, okay, to come to this Jazz for Peace event. Why? Because they're gonna be the VIP guests of honor. And VIP guests of honor get all kinds of perks and amenities which are listed on that link that you sent them. They, they get to go to a VIP meet and greet where they all get to mingle and they get to enjoy the fruits of whatever the sponsors give to them, okay? Sometimes they'll go there and enjoy free beverages. Sometimes they'll go there and enjoy free food. Sometimes they'll go to that meet and greet and enjoy free gifts, you know, from sponsors who put in a little gift bag. Sometimes they get all of the above, okay? So now they're there enjoying themselves in that VIP room, okay? And like I said, all of those goodies sometimes adds up to more than the, the discount ticket that they already, that, that they bought, okay? So they're literally getting paid to attend. Now from there, they go into the, into the main room where all of the other people, you know, and join them. And th not only does it enable them, those roots, Okay, it enables them to confirm their event with funds already raised for that outstanding cause. So that outstanding cause not only has a free event, think about it, if you were to go put on an event right now, who's gonna give you all that for free? You're gonna have to buy this and rent that and rent this and do that. A lot of times they have to go to an event planner and contract him because he knows how to do all those things. So now you got a free event with money already in your account, okay? And we haven't even started growing the branches. Now with this confirmed event, okay, that can't be canceled because all these people are on board, okay? Now we can grow the branch of local business sponsors. We can get local business sponsors involved the same way Jazz for Peace has been getting local business sponsors involved for the past 20 years for all of our other events. We can get publicity and awareness on this branch the same way that Jazz for Peace has been getting publicity and awareness for outstanding causes for 20 years. We can get new and prestigious supporters the same way we've been doing it on the other podcast I told you, you know, Michael Bloomberg, he was one of the first new and prestigious, but we, we realized we can do this for every event, you know? Well, you look at this event, Ralph Nader came on board. You look at this event, so-and-so, such-and-such. Now, you go to this uh, tree, we can get sometimes major corporations, you know, but when you have this in place, you have what it takes to approach these major corporations. And 
we have tons of fundraising techniques that we've learned from all these different organizations throughout the years. We can test out some of these new fundraising. We can teach you these new fundraising techniques, and we can choose some of them together to raise more funds for you from the uh, uh, front new from the new and amazing fundraising techniques. Okay, which is another branch. At the end, what do we have? We have an organization that is more that is more befriended an organization that is more sponsored, an organization that is more publicized, an organization that is more prestigious, an organization that is more funded, okay? An organization that is more, um, uh, how could we say, skilled at fundraising, okay? Going forward than ever before. An organization that is better at all these they had a helpful step forward in all of these areas. What does that amount to? It amounts to a helpful step forward, which you need. Lord knows you need a helpful step forward, and that's what Jazz Your Peace can pull off for you. So that's the most important thing I would tell somebody if they want to, you know, just know what is Jazz Your Peace in a nutshell, and why, why do you have so many testimonies that people have? Well, we just do the same thing. It's just that when you do this, you always get a new and unique and different result. But the bottom line is a helpful step forward, and every organization needs that in their own special way. And so, people, let me just let you know, audience, that that um, go back and watch the other two videos that they are must. They've changed the lives of people. As a, like a friend of mine that wants to become a book writer, but it's due to he really enjoyed the second video. Um, it's a nonprofit organization that helps other uh, organizations that are trying to help the community um, all, you know, any part of the world. And um, he shared the story last time about it, it, it helped a child that, that was being bullied that get a, a better perspective. And from there to, to going to, to Africa, and this is, that was California, but to Africa and there may be a, a situation, I'll let him explain. I think you're much better than I am at tell him about the Africa thing for, you know, just to kind of give him a perspective. Well, I mean, it, this model, okay, there's no place, there is no place where you can't repeat the model. Why? Because we are modeled after a tree. If you look at a tree and where does a tree not grow? I don't even know. Okay. I mean, you go in the ocean, there are these vines, right? There's these uh, kelp, kelp grows. There's, there's even trees in the ocean. So anyway, if a tree can grow there, jazz for peace can go there. But I don't know. Is that rhyme? That's maybe yeah, I yeah, yeah. throw that in our, our little book, right? If a tree can yeah. grow there, jazz for peace can go there. So right. basically our model is, help us plant the roots because we can't plant the roots without you. They're, they're your VIPs now that we're helping good. We're getting on board so we can grow your empowerment tree, which is all of those branches and all the other things that I've, that I've said. And um, yeah, I mean, where we're going to go, I just, you know, I never in a million years realized we would have gone to, you know, let's say Uganda, where you could, you can go on YouTube and you type in Jazz for Peace Uganda and you'll see that, you know, unless that's on Vimeo. I think that's on Vimeo. So you go Google, you know, Jazz for Peace Uganda, Jazz for Peace Ghana, uh, you know, Jazz for Peace Rwanda, Jazz for Peace Kenya, you know, and see all these different places. But you don't have to do Africa. You could do, you know, um, you could do Jazz for Peace Nepal. You know, Jazz for Peace Pakistan, you know what I mean? Jazz for Peace India. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just, um, let's put it this way, it's kind of out of my hands. Um, I just, it, it's on it, you know, it's, it's on its own. It, it's a, I don't know, is it a runaway train? I don't know, but it's, it's on, it's taken on a life of its own. That would be the best description. Mm -hmm. It has taken on, and its journey has brought me here today with you. The, right. This journey has brought me here with you today, so I'm yeah. very grateful. Yeah. So, from from a child being bullied to Pakistan dealing with um, illiteracy, right? Um, to Africa go, dealing with mm -hmm. um, the environment, any type right. of issue that's going to help human society, 
If you're mm -hmm. a nonprofit organization, you definitely would like art. He said, not a, a, may not right. you just have a good cause. Contact them. Right. And they're there to help. You know, they're there to, to help you improve and, 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 and help you get the funds and, and solve that human um, need. And it's a wonderful organization. He started it with um, a thought, writing a poem about about 9-11 um, and it, as it says jazz for peace it is jazz for, for, for world peace and and human embitterment and, and helping helping the, the environment so that's that's it uh last thing I not, just to, not to forget and not to forget that we've now added as if it wasn't already enough we've even right, added right. cryptocurrency so we've right. added cryptocurrency so now there's more there's more to gain than i guess ever with the addition of that but i'd have to for sure say there's more than ever before yeah Crypt cryptocurrency um and it just tell us just one last time just to just where the just just basically just where to contact you and um thanks it's been a great i've been a wonderful experience wonderful wonderful um, third interview. Thank you. So uh, the best way to reach us is really by email. And I would say before you send us an email, just check, check us out. You know, uh, you could even check out some of the things that we've been talking about just now, you know, just watch it. You know, probably if you watch uh, these these podcasts that Eric has done, my God, you're going to know an awful lot about Jazz for Peace just from that. So anyway, like I said, Learn a little bit about us, and then I would say uh, you can write to us at info at jazzforpeace.org. So that's I-N-F-O at jazzforpeace, J-A-Z-Z-F-O-R-P-E-A-C-E dot O-R-G. Real simple, info at jazzforpeace.org. And you can just send us a comment uh, or whatever you want to say, and we're just off to the races from there. Thank you so very much for your for your time and your generosity to share with, with a definitely um, wonderful organization that's doing tons of great work using jazz, but using you know humanitarian humanitarian um, efforts. Really appreciate that, and we really appreciate you being on um, American Authors and Others. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, just thank you. We'll end the program now. Thank you.